My name is Andrew Goff, and it gives me great pleasure to present the following interview with Graham Hancock. This interview took place in July 2012. It's been featured by New Dawn magazine, so please do look for a, a written transcript featured in the magazine's late summer edition. So let me just start by, by thanking you, Graham, for this opportunity and posing the, uh, the following question to, uh, to get us started. Can you believe that your seminal book, Fingerprints of the Gods, The Evidence of Earth's Lost Civilization, was first published over 17 years ago? And we are now on the eve of the end of the Mayan calendar, a historical event that you helped inform the world was coming. Yeah, it's really bizarre, actually, um, the feeling that 17 years has passed. Um, I, I think, like everybody else, I have the sense of the acceleration of time. Um, each day, each week, each month just seems to rush past uh, like a, an unstoppable train. And um, looked at ob objectively, I have no sense at all that 17 years has passed. It seems like yesterday that I was going through the, the, the struggles and the explorations that led to me uh, writing uh, Fingerprints of the Gods and to uh, discovering what was for me at the time a whole, a whole new area of inquiry. Um, I, had, I had had a sense for a long time that there was um, that there was a story to be told about uh, human history and prehistory. Um, this came this came partly from a, from a feeling that our society is too uh, rigidly uh, in awe of uh, narrow, specialized experts in in particular fields, and that the story that they choose to tell yeah. uh, is too easily adopted as the only story. Um, and I, I had a feeling that there was another story to tell uh, about the past, and that's why I began to research fingerprints of the gods. Could there be something missing in the in the record, uh, in the story that we tell ourselves about about the past? And I set out to look for that. Um, it was uh, it, it was it, it was very much a feeling that there that there. That another side to the story of the past needed to be told, and that that was my job and my responsibility in that in that work, and that in the process, um, I educated myself uh, about the past uh, and 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 learnt about it as I went along. For example, I had to I had to learn about astronomy, which was something that I didn't know anything about, uh, but but it it became it became clear to me that. You can't really get to grips with the uh, mindset of ancient civilizations, particularly the, the civilization of ancient Egypt, but it's equally true of the civilizations of C Central America, South America, India also. You really can't get to grips with that unless you get to grips with astronomy uh, and the relationship between heaven and earth, between sky and ground, and how these ideas uh, interconnect with, uh, with, with spiritual uh, ideas about the nature of reality and the nature of the soul. Uh, so, so it was a it was a learning process for me. And in that in that learning process, during the early nineties, um, I did come across the Mayan calendar, uh, and and the notion in the Mayan calendar that something comes to an end uh, on the twenty first of December two thousand and two thousand and twelve, um, and I, I think. I've gone on learning uh, since I wrote Fingerprints of the Gods, uh, and one of the things that has um, has become you know more and more clear to me, and I think it should be obvious to any thinking person who examines this material, um, is that the the Maya are not saying uh, that the world ends on the twenty first of December two thousand and twelve. They're saying that uh, a great cycle of the human story reaches a culmination and a new cycle begins. This is a, an eminently cyclical calendar. And it's interesting that in the, the long count calendar, you know, the last five, I believe it's 5,126 years or so, um, are the 
13 baktuns of the uh, of of the long ca- ca- calendar and what's interesting about that is that that's precisely the period uh, of what i would you know define as as urban centrally controlled civilization that's mm. that's really when the the story of civilization as we have understood it the city state civilization means has to do with the word city begins to arise uh, and becomes the dominant form and the and the dominant force uh, and so what's interesting to me about that is that in a way now at this point as we approach the 21st of December 2012 I think we're also what we are approaching um, is the the limits of the state model that that really you can trace almost all the problems in the world today to the sickness of the state uh, and to the institutions that prop up and are associated with the state uh, which include the large mainstream religions all of these centralized hierarchical expert led priest led institutions uh, have their origins in precisely this period that the Mayan calendar, whether by accident or, or design, has clearly demarcated a period of just over 5,000 years from 3,000 plus BC down to down to today. And uh, whereas that model may have had its place in human history and may even have, have been fundamentally necessary in the human story, I do feel that it has reached a point of, of utter decay now mm. and that it's mm. very deeply unhelpful mm. uh, to, to, to the world. I think one of the most negative influences in the world today is the state, uh, the large bureaucracies, the large armed bureaucracies uh, that seek to remove power from the individual and control everything uh, s- centrally, which even deny us uh, the, the right to sovereignty over our own bodies and our own consciousness. All of these are rooted and grounded in the idea that the state knows better than we do what we should be doing mm. with our lives. So that's what I see coming to an end. Uh, and it's not an overnight thing. It's a process, as everything cyclical is. And we're, we're caught up in a very interesting moment in that process, but it would be na- naive to say that the process clearly sharply cuts off on the 21st of December 2012 and something completely new starts on the 22nd. No, it's not going to be like that. We're caught up in a cusp moment, in a period of struggle and and turmoil where things are going to change. Whether the state likes it or not, the state can dig in its heels, it can keep magically creating electronic money and throwing it at these these, uh, economic problems that we're seeing all over the world. Keep on doing that for a while, but sooner or later that system is going to come down and it's just one of those extraordinary and remarkable things that the Mayan calendar picked a series of dates that exactly encapsulates the period of the rise and the beginning of the decline and fall of the state model. How much attention is paid to the end of um, the Mayan long count calendar, but in your estimation, what was significant about the start date? Well, you know, th- this, is, this is curious, and I, can't, I, can't, I actually can't answer that question. All I, can, all I can tell you is that when we look at what we understand of history, we can say that that date of around 3100 BC does mark quite closely, you know, give or take a few hundred years, quite closely the beginning of the emergence of the city-state. Mm. That's, what it, that's what it marks, whether by accident or design. That's roughly when it happens. Before that, we don't really have much in the way of city-states. And, 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 and after that, they, they gradually become the dominant model. So it seems like um, by picking that date, which, which already was a date before the beginning of Mayan civilization, of course, there was an earlier culture called the Olmecs, and we know that the Maya mm. inherited their calendar from the Olmecs. They didn't mm. invent it. Um, but, but by picking that date, they, they seem to have coincided with a particular moment in human history, which, which saw a change from, um, you know, agricultural village and, and even hunter-gatherer societies into centralized city-states with, mm. with uh, you know, is, is established structures which controlled the way life would be, life would be led. With respect to fingerprints, in hindsight, I'm just wondering, were you prepared for the responsibility that came with the success of the mm. book, and, and how do you feel about your role as dare I say, the elder statesman of the genre today? Well, I think, first of, first of all, I need, to, I need to make it very clear that the um, fingerprints of the gods could never have been written 
and would never have happened at all um, if there were not a whole group of people working mm. in this area. Mm. This was not something extraordinary or particularly special that Graham Hancock did. Um, I regard myself as first and foremost a reporter and a journalist. Um, and, and as such, uh, what I do is I synthesize data. And uh, Fingerprints of the Gods happened to catch a moment um, mm. in, in our interest in certain subjects. And the reason it caught that moment was because a lot of people from, were coming from different angles and looking at different elements of the mystery of the past. And mm. to name a few... Um, I would say, and I, 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 I cite all of these individuals in the book, Rand and Rose Flemath with their, with their work on earth crust displacement, following up the, the work of um, Professor Hapgood, uh, Robert Boval uh, with his uh, extraordinary work on the, on the Orion correlation, which really radically changed our understanding um, of the pyramids and what they're, and what they're all about. And, and, and the um, deep antiquity that they're connected to. Mm. Uh, John Anthony West and Professor Robert Schock uh, from, from, from Boston University. John West, radical Egyptologist, thinking things through in a different way, realizing that there's something wrong with the story of the Sphinx, and Robert Schock backing that up with, uh, with geological observations. You know, all of these, all of these people uh, were... were working away, doing incredibly important original work of discovery. And part of my function um, was, to, was, was, was to write a book that put all of that work together into, in, into a bigger picture. So I don't, I don't claim any special prominence for being... I, I, I think, in a way, I was, it was my good fortune to be there at the time and to be able to comment and observe on these events and these, and these discoveries and to put them in a framework... Um, that suggested behind all of this, you know, we may be, we may really be looking at at, at, at a huge forgotten episode in, in, in human history, and that's why I called the book Fingerprints of the Gods because it's like there's all these little traces and hints all 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 around the world, and as you, as you begin to add them up, they emerge into this this uh, extraordinary picture of something huge uh, missing from our fr from our story. So. So I, I really want to be to be very clear that that um, that book could never have been written if it if it weren't for the f fantastic original work that was being done by others and that I reported uh, in that book. Um, and 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 secondly, if there hadn't been at the time uh, a public mood that was receptive mm. uh, to criticism of the past. Um, there's been a backlash since then, but uh, there was something curious about the early 90s and the mid 90s. There was a there was a definite mood of of impatience and and uh, and, and unwillingness to accept the status quo in the air. Can, can, can I ask you a little bit about the uh, the backlash? I mean, before we continue, uh, I, I'd love to ask you about something that has always troubled me, and 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 that is, I speak of your treatment in the 1999 BBC Horizon special which you were ultimately vindicated for. Mm. Uh, I remember watching in horror at the BBC's premeditated aggression. And it, do, do you feel that the attitude exhibited by the BBC at the time is now a thing of the past and was an apology enough for you to reconcile their assault on your name? Well, uh, again, I think, first of all, when you, when you get into the, into the field of exploring radical new ideas and challenging the status quo um, and I perhaps I didn't realize this fully at the time because the the you know the whole success of fingerprints of the gods and the speed with which things developed took me quite by surprise mm. um, when you get into that field I think you have you absolutely have to expect to be attacked it, it just totally comes with the territory and I think I and Robert Boval and I were both, you know, jointly attacked in that BBC Horizon program. I think we were we were singled out because our books, books that he had written separately, I'd written separately, and mm. books that we'd written together, mm. were particularly prominent, were number one bestsellers in many different countries, had a had a huge impact. I think we were singled out as the sort of figureheads. 
um, of what was seen in mainstream academia as a kind of movement that needed to be attacked. Um, and and uh, we, were, we were singled out because our books had been successful. If our books had not been successful, nobody would have bothered. Um, but because they were successful, uh, this was extremely annoying to academics. It was annoying that, that our, our, our books were selling in huge numbers of copies and their books weren't. Mm. Uh, it was annoying to them because they felt they really had the monopoly on the story of the past and how dare we challenge that right. uh, when Robert is an engineer and I'm a journalist. What on earth do we think we're doing? Uh, and that there was a strong feeling that we needed to be put uh, in, in our places. And... While it's rather unpleasant to be attacked like that, uh, I've come I've come to realise that it really is absolutely to be expected. And furthermore, uh, which I didn't realise so much at the time, uh, academics also attack each other in exactly the same way. I, I mean, really, it's uh, it, it, there's something very very horrible about the way that academics will focus on the destruction of another academic's career mm. if they don't happen to like the ideas of that person or if that person's ideas conflicts with their own. I've seen it happen again and again now. Where, where, so it isn't, it isn't just that we were outsiders. Academics actually do this to themselves. And it's particularly true in the fields of history, archaeology, and Egyptology, and prehistory, the assassination of another man or woman's ideas, an attempt to utterly destroy that person as well as their ideas, to just get rid of them completely. This is quite common behaviour. Partly comes with the scientific method, which is, mm -hmm. which is based on destructive criticism in, and, the, and based on the notion that if an idea can survive sufficient destructive attacks, then there may actually be some merit to that idea. And I do see the point of that. However, I think that history also shows that for, for quite long periods of time, very good and valuable ideas can get lost or buried because of that method, which could have actually come to the fore earlier if a, perhaps a different approach were to be taken. Perhaps instead of saying, what can we find in this idea that we can utterly trash and destroy, perhaps it might be more interesting if the academic community were to say, what can we find in this idea that might be worthwhile and useful to us in the mm. future? Uh, you know, that's also a possible approach, but it isn't the approach of the, of the scientific method at the moment. That's based on destructive criticism. And what the BBC was doing was acting as a vehicle for mainstream academics who were very upset by young archaeology students who were coming to them in class and saying, we've heard that history might not be quite this way. It might be a, it might be a different way. Um, and and um, th th therefore, Robert and I were attacked as the figureheads of uh, a movement that was resented and hated by mainstream academics. But we were attacked with precisely the methods, the attack dog methods that they use on each other. Exactly. Um, and the fact that we were attacked uh, was also a sign um, that at some level, our ideas were being taken seriously. Exactly. You were on to something, otherwise they wouldn't bother. They wouldn't bother. The, the, the quickest and easiest way to get rid of an annoying idea is simply to ignore it. Um, but when an idea reaches a certain level of public acceptance, it can't be ignored anymore. And I think, I think what academics were used to was what they call the lunatic fringe or pyramidians. Um, and what I think they found threatening about Robert and myself and, and John Anthony West and the Flemaths and others uh, was that you know, fr frankly, we are actually quite r reasonable people and can put a logical argument and can and 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 can approach it from us mm. from a scientific point of view. Uh, you know, we're not working on the basis of faith; we're working on the basis of evidence. Right. Um, but we're saying we see a problem with the way that evidence is being deployed at, mm. the, at, 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 at the moment. So I think that I think it was a sign that we're, we were being, you know, taken a, as, as serious contenders. And, and I think it was inevitable. Um, and uh, I also think by 1999, I think it was when this when this came out, um, perhaps I myself had become overconfident. Um, I'd had uh, I'd had a lot of success. I when I look back on the story of my, of my my life and those particular years, I think I was arrogant. I think I was um, I think I was cocky. I think um, I felt invulnerable. Um, I actually think I needed to be taken down a peg, 
which is uh, which is what the BBC did to me. It certainly did take me down a peg. It was a very very painful experience for me. Um, I think that uh, in a way I had it coming to me. Um, you know, I should have been. I was six weeks before the BBC contacted me. A friend in television called me up, and he said, Graham. I've heard that the BBC are planning to stitch you up. That's, I don't know if you know that phrase. That's a, oh, absolutely. You know, absolutely. They're, 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 they're planning to, 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 to really create a, 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 a scenario that completely messes you, messes you about. He said, I've heard the BBC are going to stitch you up. They're going to call you and ask you for an interview. Say no. Six weeks later, I got the call. The first thing I did was say yes. Why did I say yes? Because I felt very confident in myself. I felt that I could handle myself perfectly in argument and debate. Um, what I didn't reckon with was um, dirty tricks in the in in the cutting room. I hadn't expected that from the from the BBC, uh, and it's why uh, this particular program, as far as I know, it's the it was the only one in 35 or 36 years of the history of Horizon where a complaint to the Broadcasting Standards Commission that Robert and I brought was actually upheld. Um, they, they previously Horizon had had an unblemished record, and they were obliged to to re-edit the film. Now they make the point that only one out of what was it ten of our objections uh, to the BBC film was actually upheld, and the other nine weren't upheld. But uh, to me, that's no point at all. Mm. Uh, you know, because um, with a large institution like the BBC, with huge amounts of money, they can cover their tracks very, very well indeed. Uh, you know, so it's rather like uh, Al Capone, you know, they got him on tax evasion. Um, but yeah. uh, fundamentally, he'd done a lot of other things wrong as well. Well, we got the BBC on one particularly glaring point that they had to admit they had completely misrepresented. But there were many other points that they managed to fudge around enough to escape the judgment. But they were still, as far as I'm concerned, uh, behaving dishonestly. Um, so it was a, it was a lesson um, it, uh, it definitely, uh, caused me to rethink my approach to things. And after going through a period of feeling poor me, I've been victimized. It, it actually made, made me feel I had that coming to me. I had to learn that lesson. Um, I can't expect to be challenging mainstream ideas in a huge issue like history without being attacked. You know, if you can't stand the heat, get out of the kitchen. And that is definitely part of the heat of that particular kitchen. So I, I think in the end, they did me a favor. Well, that's that's a very, uh, very impressive perspective. I mean, those of us who have always uh, extracted a lot of value from your work, were it was clear that it was a premeditated um, attempt. It wasn't a conclusion of, of their experience of you. It was premeditated. And we were thrilled that you did something about it. And then you went yeah. and you complained and... and uh, on behalf of everyone who who is an uh, uh, enthusiast of that subject matter, you know, but thank you for that. Thank you. So, want to just linger around with fingerprints for a little bit longer, and we have so much more to cover. But I just mm -hmm. want to ask you, just a couple months now before um, the big date, December twenty first, what's your current view about what may or may not happen? I. Uh, to be honest, I don't think anything's going to happen on the 21st of December 2012. People often ask me, where am I going to be on that date? Uh, where I want to be on that date is in the loving embrace of my family, surrounded by my children and my wife, having a good time. That's, that's only where I want to be. Um, I don't want to go climb a mountain to hide from any coming t tidal wave or go to some underground shelter. Um, I, 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 I don't I don't know whether 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 any cataclysmic earth change is coming. I actually don't think it is. Um, I don't think you can pin anything like that down to such an such 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 a narrow window. What I what I do think is that for all of us, um, for, for 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 all of us, we have this we have the incredible gift of being born in a human body we are incre it's incredibly fortunate you know we, we might be born a, a a fruit fly or 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 you, you know a, a stone or, uh, the, the, we we're, we're human beings we have the, we have we have this incredible equipment the, the, this amazing uh, uh, ability to see the difference between between right and wrong to make to make choices to learn and to grow and and to develop we have this precious opportunity of life 
and all of us it's it's just inevitable we're all going to die that's 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 what happens you know uh, perhaps now i'm 60 61 coming on 62 my you know as the years go by you you begin to focus perhaps a little bit a, a little bit more on that but life doesn't go on forever we don't know what happens afterwards i happen to believe we come back i can't prove that um, but I, I can't see the point of a universe that provides just one life. I think I think mm. I think it's a much more mysterious process than that. Um, but surely the most Im- the most important thing is to live life right and to and to use this gift that we've been given to the fullest possible extent um, and not to add to the misery and darkness in the world, but to do whatever we can to subtract from it and to bring light and joy and goodness and to, to give love. So, so I, I think my, my, my feeling about, about 2012 is it's a reminder that we're here to love and mm. that uh, that's what we should be doing and, and living as far as possible positive lives. Uh, which means which means uh, positive lives in relation to others as as well, and that's you know that remains true whether or not some great cataclysm is coming. Right. It remains true whether or not the world economy is going to collapse. Right. Um, it remains true whether or not the madness of the state driven system and 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 the madness of mainstream religions is going to is going to plunge us into a cataclysmic man made global war. Mm. Uh, all any of us can do is make choices as individuals to live positive and nurturing lives that are filled with love and light rather than with darkness and with hate. And if we make that decision at the individual level, every one of us, then the light is going to grow in the world. What, what, what may I ask um, is your view on reincarnation and and also, why now more than ever are, are people feeling as though uh, they have led many, many lives and seem to be, dare I say, recalling them? Yeah. Well, first of all, I, I mean, reincarnation makes perfect sense to me. It seems to, it seems to me a very reasonable proposition. I think it was Vol- Voltaire who said that it's no more extraordinary to be born twice than to be born once, you know. Um, and and um, that's great. You know, there's this the, the, there's there's this uh, f- fantastic investment that nature and evolution and the universe have made in in forming planets and allowing life to evolve on it, where life re- reaches reaches a form where it can really make very fine distinctions b- between things and contemplate such matters as as good and good and evil. Um, and 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 it seem it seems to me I can I can only say this is a belief system. I have no facts to back this up. This is this is important to realize. And I think it's also, but it's also important. And I I I, I do feel this point needs to be made that that when uh, somebody says from the opposite point of view, people who call themselves atheists, although you know an a- atheist technically means a disbelief in God. Um, and I think it's possible it's possible to be an atheist and still to believe uh, in continuity of spirit uh, and 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 in a transcendental meaning to life. Uh, but those who define themselves as atheists are often people who also uh, seek to define the universe in strictly material terms. So they say reality is only the material world. They say uh, our body is made of matter. When the matter dies, when the brain dies, then consciousness dies, everything is gone, we're just meat, there's nothing else to it. I think it's important to recognize that that is also a belief system. That is not a fact. It's very often presented as a fact by people like Richard Dawkins. Uh, and they do so with great eloquence and great persuasiveness. And, the, and there's a great tendency amongst the public, just as there is a tendency to to look at reincarnation, there's also huge swathes of the public who are very persuaded by the Richard Dawkins point of view, which is that there is no meaning to life, that we are purely accidents of chemistry and biology. I think it's important to realize that both views, that life goes on, that there is reincarnation, that there is meaning, that there is transcendental purpose, and the opposite view, that there is no meaning, that life ends with death, that there isn't, that we're all accidents of physics and chemistry, both of these systems are actually belief systems. They're not facts. Right. Neither one is fact. Um, so when a man like Richard Dawkins says there is no life after death, he's actually stating his own religious point of view, not a fact. Mm-hmm. 
Um, and my own uh, religious point of view is that uh, uh, it seems to me highly likely that uh, consciousness survives death. And I, I've, I've tried to make this point in recent lectures that, that we, the materialist science works with a model of the brain that says the brain uh, generates consciousness uh, rather in the way that a factory makes cars. And um, therefore, when the brain is dead, consciousness is dead. That's, that's a view. But again, that is not a fact. That is a model. That is an opinion. Right. Uh, and it's equally possible, and all the measurements would remain the same, that the brain is a receiver or a transceiver of consciousness. Uh, that, that the brain is the junction point between the material and the immaterial realm. Uh, that it is the point through which consciousness manifests into the material plane. Right. Uh, rather in the way that a, a, a television signal manifests as pictures through a television set. Um, when you destroy the TV set, the signal is still there. Uh, consciousness could equally well be that way. And then people say, oh, but we've proved that, the, that there's nothing more to consciousness than, than matter, because if you damage a particular area of the brain, then this or that function goes. Well, that's true. But if you damage a particular area of a television set, then this or that function goes too. But the signal is still there. Yeah. So, so I think, I think it's, um, it's perfectly reasonable to suppose that we, as all of the ancient wisdom traditions maintain, that we incarnate in these bodies. Uh, in order to undergo experiences which help us to learn and to grow and to develop. Uh, and if that is the case, then it would make complete sense that we would incarnate more than once, uh, because there's an awful lot to learn. And at different periods of history, there's different things to learn, um, different challenges, different, different, uh, different experiences to, to, to undergo. Do you, do you think we choose our parents, we choose our race? Again, it, makes, it make, kind of makes sense to me kind of makes sense that that we we have it we set a particular objective for this life you know that there's stuff we need to get here we need to learn this stuff we need to it really needs to come home to us and one thing about this incarnation in this in this physical world is it really does bring things home to you if you if you open up there are consequences to all actions everything has a cost everything has a benefit it's always the you know it, it all balances out in the end um, this is a realm filled with consequences, and, and um, so yes, we are, we are we are here to learn and to grow and to develop, and perhaps we do choose our incarnations, and perhaps we do uh, incarnate in groups with others, and we do, you know, meet people who we've known who we've known before. I, it, make, it makes perfect <coughs> sense to me, and perhaps we have stuff to work through with mm. them, you know, that we didn't work through in a previous life, and we and we've got to go back and do it again until we until we get it right to, to me this is this is a this, this is a more elegant and subtle model than the model of mainstream christianity or, or or islam or judaism that says you know you do this you go to heaven you do that you go to hell there's stuff we got to learn that's what this amazing theater of experience has been created for maybe we ourselves created it as spirits you know maybe that is the fundamental nature of consciousness maybe consciousness is a non-physical force within the universe that needs to manifest physically in order to learn stuff and to grow to an, to an, to another level all of that makes perfect sense to me i can't i can't prove it um, and and i think part of the deal is you can't prove it as well this, this is this is it. I mean, what use would the game be if you knew all the rules beforehand? You wouldn't be playing it straight then. Part of the part of the part of the reason why this game is such an amazing teaching experience is that you actually don't know what the jeopardy is for sure. You can persuade yourself that you're just meat, and that there are no long-term, eternal consequences to your actions, or you can make the choice that there are consequences to your actions. Uh, well, as I've gone through the process of life and I've made my mistakes. I've become more and more certain that there are transcendental consequences to all of our actions. And, that, and, and I'm much more aware of this today than I was 20 years ago, that anything and everything I do will have consequences for me. Uh, and I'd better be very serious about what I do. I better think about every action that I take that's going to impact another person. Because it's not, you know, just that action. It's going to impact them eternally and it's going to impact me eternally it's very 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 heavy weight uh and 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 i should be sure that i'm doing the right thing before i do anything that's that's the conclusion i've come to all of our choices 
uh, define us. And we should be very careful about the choices we make. We should not act lightly or thoughtlessly in ways that impact others and impact ourselves. We should consider that this may have, this may have huge implications over millions of years, not just over this one lifetime. In Fingerprints of the Gods, and just a moment ago, you were gracious to recount all the, the people whose footsteps um, you walked in while writing the book, and, and one of them, uh, um, two of them, the, the researchers mm. for Hamlet's Mill. Yeah. So we all talk about the Mayans, but there's many different civilizations that have a uh, belief that there's four or five epochs, four or five suns, and we're all in the end of the last. Yeah. Um, so if 2012 comes and goes without uh, an cataclysmic incident are, are we out of the woods it, 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 and and is a cataclysm the right context to be thinking about what happens at the end of these suns well no we're definitely not out of the woods um, uh, something else that that um, that I've come to realize and I, I suppose is incorporated in my own religious or spiritual f framework such as it is um, is um, is the notion of um, good and evil uh, as operative forces in the universe, um, and and again, all of the ancient uh, religions looked at this very seriously. In, in in ancient Egypt, it was Horus and Set who 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 defined these two polarities. You know, there's a there's a there's a modern fashion to say to which is against dualism and which is to say that everything is one and we're not supposed to think things like that. But I actually do feel that good and evil are fundamental poles. Uh, in the universe, and 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 to you know to to narrow it down to a finer point, I think that I think that in our world, uh, evil is anything that operates to diminish human potential, mm. to stop us learning and growing and mm. developing, um, to lead us away from from the light and 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 into darkness. That's what that's what evil is, and good is 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 anything that helps us to. To, to grow, to become more nurturing, more 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 giving, um, and and to learn the lessons that we're that we're here to learn, and you know part of the problem with the world today, as I see it, and part of the problem with the state, um, is that it seems to be a gig and mainstream religions is that they are a gigantic mechanism to stop people learning and growing and developing, mm -hmm. and therefore I see the hand of evil mm -hmm. at work mm -hmm. uh, in those things. The Gnostics would have called it the Archons. Um, are are at work um, in in shutting down human potential. So uh, we do live at a at a very crucial junction junction point. And even if the date of twenty first of December two thousand and twelve is not is, is is no more than a general marker, which I believe to be the case. Nevertheless, you know we should we should recognise that that we have come to a time when people need to make very fundamental choices. Um, and that and that we are unlikely it is unlikely to be beneficial to the human species and to us as individual souls seeking to learn and to grow and develop in this environment to continue with the existing model um, and that there will continue to be a struggle to change to change that model and to come up with something that's more nurturing and that, that more allows growth to take place and I'm not saying that there wasn't a place perhaps once for the state but I think it's time is over your, your work with Robert Bavall has always been fascinating, and in your most recent work together, The Master Game, you touch upon the political aspects of the occult. What do you feel is the impact of politics as it pertains to the occult and the study and the excavation of antiquities? Hmm. Um, well, what The Master Game is about for me, and, and that book was previously called Talisman, it's a reworking of an, an older book that Robert and I did together, um, is... Um, I was particularly, uh, I'll speak for my part of that book, I, I was particularly focused on the, on the Gnostic uh, tradition uh, in, in that book. And Gnosticism is in fact a very radical worldview. Uh, and what Gnosticism is suggesting about the mainstream religions, about Christianity, Judaism and Islam, is first of all that they all worship the same entity. Uh, who is referred to as uh, Jehovah or Yahweh in the Christian uh, and, and Judaic tradition and Allah in the, in the Islamic tradition. And that from the Gnostic point of view, this uh, entity uh, called Jehovah is not a god. Um, he is an imposter. He is a demon 
who uh, presents himself as a god. You know, there used to be a, there was a saying in that film, The Usual Suspects, that the smartest trick the devil ever played was to convince the world that he did not exist. Gnostics would take that a step further. They'd say the smartest trick the ever, devil ever played was to convince the world that he is God. Um, that the actual, you actually um, insert the demonic into the mainstream religions. And that would explain, from the Gnostic point of view, it clearly did explain why these religions talk the talk of peace and love, but actually walk the walk of hatred and cruelty and violence. Uh, any religion that can stone a fellow human being to death, any religion that can burn a fellow human being at the stake, what kind of God is that? History is written by the victors, and does that, does that fact ever make you wonder if the wrong God won? Well, yeah, I think the wrong God won. I think absolutely, and I think we saw the process when, when Gnosticism was stamped out, mm -hmm. when, when a certain faction within Christianity uh, aligned itself with the Emperor Constantine and the Roman state and began to burn people at the stake for having, for having alternate points of view. And the alternate point of view was driven underground. Um, and that was an alternate point of view that, that said that, that spiritual experience is fundamental, that we don't need these intermediaries who call themselves you know, priests or, or mullahs or rabbis to tell us how to relate to the spirit. What we have to have is a, is a direct experience of spirit, um, a, a, a revelation, if you like. And, and uh, I think it's pretty clear that the early Gnostic sects were, were using visionary agents. Um, and and uh, it's not an accident that the that the tree of the Garden of Eden is often depicted as a, a hallucinogenic um, mushroom in in ancient in ancient art. Uh, that these allies, these plant allies, were being were being used to gain direct access to the divine. And when you have that direct access to the divine, you don't need the hierarchy. You don't need the priest. You don't need the mullah. You don't need the rabbi. They have no function whatsoever. How dare they stand there and tell us how we may relate to the divine, uh, particularly when their works in the world involve so much hatred, so much fear, mm -hmm. so much suspicion, so much downright wicked, evil cruelty mm -hmm. is, is manifested through these mainstream religions. How dare they claim that they are the sole instruments of good in, good in the world? Mm -hmm. and, and, you know... Um, they, 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 they've created a, a, a global system filled with, filled with hatred. There's no good comes of this. Mm. Gnostics saw this a long time ago. Mm. They saw that it was coming. So there's been an underground stream mm. which has carried the idea of the Gnostic revelation through history, despite the oppression. And that underground stream is still uh, active. Uh, today and it's partly a process of self-discovery. It doesn't have to be a secret society. It's a process of revelation. People can come to this themselves. Um, but some of the ancient texts are very, very helpful. So when the Nag Hammadi Library was was buried near the Temple of Dendera um, back in the 350, 400 A.D. period. Um, what was buried there was a time capsule that was rediscovered in 1945. Until then we only knew about Gnostic ideas through those who had persecuted them. They were the main source for our knowledge of Gnostic ideas, they, and, and therefore, indeed, the victors were writing history. But the rediscovery of the Nag Hammadi Library gave us direct access to Gnostic texts, and it's in those texts where we read, for example, that the, um, that the serpent in the Garden of Eden is the good guy, not the bad guy. That, that what he's bringing is revelation and knowledge, that what he's pointing out is that that thing called Yahweh lied to you, you know. Mm. He said you would die if you ate of this tree. Did you die? No. Uh, and now he wants to stop you reaching the tree of life. You know, this is um, the, the, the very fundamental teachings here, which are extremely disturbing and extremely upsetting to anybody who's deeply indoctrinated in any of the mainstream religions. Well, yeah, you look at something like Lucifer, which we're conditioned to think it was a really bad man, but his name means bringer of light. Bringer of that light, doesn't yeah. sound very yeah. evil yeah. to me. And not, not, to, not to me either. And what is, and, 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 and again, of course, you know, the, 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 the knee-jerk Christian faction will immediately say, oh, you're a devil worshipper. But, but what actually are we worshipping in this creature called Yahweh, called mm -hmm. Jehovah? What are we, what are we worshipping? Look, look at the stories in the Old Testament. Look at look his at, actions. Look at the things that this, that this entity did. Mm. This, is, this is not a loving 
beautiful Benevolent. divine light. This is a this is a dark creature which tells a man to kill his own son, you know, mm. which which says that if somebody behaves in a certain way, if somebody's a homosexual, for example, they should be killed. This is written in the in the in 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 the Old Testament. Um, the Old Testament is full of evidence that the being who we have carried forward into Christianity as our God and into Islam and into Judaism is demonic and leads mankind into dark places. And the whole history of the world, of the struggle of these three, three religions over the last 2,000 years has been a struggle that has plunged mankind again and again into darkness, you know, whether it was the Crusades, whether it was the persecution of the Cathars in, in Europe in the, th the 12th and 13th centuries, you know, again and again, burnings at the stake, stoning to death, you know, pogroms against Jews, all of these things, it's all different bits. I mean, how better could a demon mess things up in the world mm -hmm. than to occupy people's minds and turn them against each other and say, I am I worship Allah, so I am going to kill somebody who worships Jehovah. I worship Jehovah, so I'm going to kill somebody who worships Allah. All of this is, this is pure demonic work. I think anybody, reasonable person can see this. Don't listen to what they say. Look at what they do. Mm -hmm. And what they do is pure, unmitigated, divisive, hatred, wickedness, suspicion, and evil. Mm -hmm. I, imagine it's a thousand years from now, and you look back on what the Internet did to humanity. What, what do you think its legacy will be? Um, I, think the, I think the Internet is a great instrument of liberation. Um, it isn't without its negative sides. Uh, it will be. Dark forces are operating in society, and they will grab on any vehicle that's uh, that's around. But the, but what they've allowed, as far as we know, for the first time in human history, at least since we stopped being telepathic, is what they've allowed is uh, for communities of ideas to develop around the world, for for people to communicate with like-minded people all over the world, um, and to do so instantly very, very, very quickly. Um, when, again, part of the old model that's coming to an end is the model based on uh, nationalism, and the nation-state. Again, we come back to this issue of the state. I personally have never understood why I should feel any special loyalty to a person who happens, to, by accident of nature, to have been born on the same piece of land that I was born on. Why should I feel special loyalty? Why should I feel, why should I feel patriotic about that? Why, should that? why should that make me feel a wonderful warm glow? When somebody waves a, a flag that happens to belong to this bit of land, why should that make me feel special? I don't get that. I don't understand that. The, what all the thing I'm interested in is a community of ideas. Do I have something in common with the ideas that this person has? There's something there that resonates with me, that, I can, that we can communicate constructively with one another. I don't care where, which piece of land they come from or, or, or anything to do with their cultural background. I only care about the, the ideas of the, of the person. And this is one of the things that the Internet is allowing to happen. Mm. It's allowing people to communicate across national boundaries. And in many cases, you see nation states trying to stop that happening, you know, because they feel threatened by it. And they should feel threatened by mm. it because, because this is part of the awakening of the human race, that we all start talking directly to each other instead of going through powerful intermediaries who tell us what to think. How about the access that it provides to these texts that were only ever meant for the elite? Amazing. This is another amazing factor of the of the internet. Uh, a tremendous, just explosive, explosive boom in in research. Actually, mm. to use a simple word for it, that there, that m material that would have been incredibly hard to access, and that what was indeed at one time limited strictly to the to the elite, now becomes widely available. That anybody can access it. Anybody can can gain contact with it and learn from it. Um, this is a huge gift that the that the internet has has given. I mean, I remember as a as a researcher, you know, if I go back to the late eighties or the or the early nineties, um, getting hold of uh, rare and difficult books was a, was a major effort. Mm -hmm. It was a major time consuming effort that you had to spend a lot of. It isn't anymore. You know, I can get hold of any text I want usually within about five minutes. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's a tremendous leap forward in the ability to, you know, to use this material, to learn from it, and to develop new synthesis from it, which is, you know, which is what we're all, we're all doing. So no, I, th I think, I think the internet is a tremendous 
is a tremendous positive, uh, f fundamental positive force uh, in the, in in the world today. And and um, you know, not, nothing is nothing is without its other side. But the fact that there are problems with the internet and that that this power is abused and, and misused doesn't mean it's wrong. It it just it just it just means that it needs to sort some stuff out. That's all. Why do you feel there has not been a significant discovery in, in Egypt or other ancient lands since Howard Carter discovered uh, Tutankhamun um, um, 90 some years ago? Well, actually, I do feel there have been significant discoveries. Um, I feel that, um, uh, for example, Robert Boval's Orion correlation uh, is a significant discovery. Yes, mainstream academia has tried to say that there's nothing to it, but it's obvious to any thinking person that there is something huge to it uh, and that it's a key that unlocks our understanding of ancient Egypt. I think that the uh, gigantic 12,000-year-old megalithic temple in Turkey called Gobekli Tepe that's been excavated in the last six or seven years by a mainstream archaeologist, by the way, um, is a hugely significant uh, discovery. I mean, this Gobekli Tepe uh, is a rather remarkable thing. Um, first of all, it's firmly dated to 12,000 years old, uh, which makes it 7,000 years older than other known megalithic sites. Um, secondly, it's highly sophisticated, which means there's a background to it which is much older than 12,000 years that we don't at present have any evidence for, but the very fact that Gobekli Tepe stands there tells us there is a background, because those people were not moving around 20 or 30 ton megaliths without some experience in the work. Um, thirdly, that the oldest stuff at Gobekli Tepe is the best, uh, and that the younger stuff is, is less good. Uh, all of this, um, I think, speaks to a, to a reawakening uh, and a reinvigoration of the idea that there has been a major forgotten episode in human history. Uh, I think Gobekli Tepe is one of the most significant discoveries in archaeology ever, and I think it will prove just to be the thin end of the wedge. I think there's so much more uh, waiting to be uh, discovered there in Turkey and elsewhere. It's a curious thing, but once you know, once you, once the mainstream gets involved and recognizes one thing, as deeply anomalous. Pretty soon other things start to show up. It's as though the mainstream didn't have permission to consider those things before, but now it does have permission to consider them. I mean, for a long time, I think, you know, dinosaur bones were, were not understood, but once it became understood that we were looking at a deeply ancient extinct species of creature, then more and more of them began to appear. It's not that they were being created, it's they were being recognized for what they were. Uh, and I think Gobekli Tepe allows us to look again at the Great Sphinx and to consider what it is, to look again at the megalithic temples on the Giza Plateau and consider that they really might be much, much older than the pyramids, to look again at the Osirion in uh, Abydos in, in Upper Egypt and at many, many other structures around the world, Tiwanaku, the megalithic phase at Sacsayhuaman in, in, in Cusco, for example. All of these have been too easily lumped into the recent historical period because the mainstream historical paradigm said there was no other time that things like this could have been made. And when I say the recent historical period, I mean the last 5,000 years. But now we have a gigantic megalithic site that is officially recognized as being 12,000 years old. Uh, and that allows us to consider again the antiquity of other known megalithic sites which may have been misdated. And did you so that's, a, that's, a, that's a, just to come to your point, that, that is... That is one, you know, very important discovery, uh, which I think in the long run is going to is going to play a huge role in rewriting ancient history. And and the other thing that's happened in the last few years, which I think is also key, uh, is the recognition um, still disputed, but but more and more evidence is coming out for it, and more and more again of the mainstream are accepting it, that there was a gigantic cometary uh, impact. Uh, which kicked off the Younger Dryas uh, event um, about uh, 13,000 years ago, somewhere between in the window between 12,000 and 13,000 years ago, between 10,000 BC and 11,000 BC. Somewhere in that window, uh, there was a, a gigantic cataclysm, which seems to have been caused by a, a comet uh, fragmenting over North America. 
uh, and creating features like the Carolina Bays and leaving a layer of iridium all around the world. Um, a, a massive event which changed global climate, which plunged the world back into the Ice Age for a thousand years at that time, and which, you know, I, I can't resist pointing out, takes place in precisely the window that Robert Boval and I both have suggested that we lost a whole episode of human civilization, which is the date we went for was 10,500 BC, 12,500 years ago, which is bang in that window. And Gobekli Tepe is in that window, 12,000 to 13,000 years ago, and now global evidence for, for, for a massive cometary impact at exactly that exactly that time. I think this is also a very important uh, discovery. It's not archaeology, it's geology, but it's, but it's saying uh, that something very bad happened in the world at that time. Well, can, can I ask you, uh, uh, it's a fascinating subject, and the fact that we're here today means we survived that, that influx of meteorites, um, but we must have a memory of those meteorites. And in fact, if you look at Cabela, the original mother goddess, she was a meteorite. Mm. Do you think... I think it's we possible do. that we worship that which disrupt our world. Well, Robert has always argued this about the Benben stone, that the the, the Benben, um, which which is symbolised as the pyramidion, the top of all um, obelisks, and the and the pyramidion on the top of all pyramids was called the Benben. That this was originally uh, a, a meteorite of some of some of some kind. I think these these cosmic uh, impacts with the with the Earth have. Um, have probably had a much bigger role to play in human history than we've wanted to admit, and that one such impact was deeply implicated in the cataclysmic events at the end of the last uh, ice age between twelve and thirteen thousand years ago. And I do think that it is memorialized in religious memory, and it is memorialized in in a global tradition of cataclysm uh, and 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 of a lost civilization. I mean, this is not just a one-time story. This is, you know, Atlantis is one of thousands of stories mm. which speak of a former golden age brought to an end by cataclysmic events very suddenly, very dramatically, very sharply, leaving only a few survivors who struggle to maintain something of the precious legacy that they had carried down from the, from the past. Um, I, I actually think there's a huge amount of testimony to this. Uh, and again, mainstream academia has not until very recently, had permission to consider that. But these new discoveries uh, perhaps give that permission and, 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 and don't leave it in the hands of, you know, radical outsiders like myself or Robert Boval or, or John Anthony West or, 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 the, or the Flemaths or, for that matter, Santillana and von Deschend, mm. uh, but leave mm. it in the hands of, um, you know, the, the, the solid mainstream. Well, and, and as if we need any more reminder of of the fact that the world we live in was shaped by uh, a cataclysm, most likely induced by meteorites. Look at the greatest pilgrimage site in the world today. The what, Kaaba, are they, yeah. what are they visiting? Yeah, they're visiting a meteorite. Um, and and I, you know, I think gods and goddesses were all, always imbued with what fell from the sky, what yeah. fell from the heavens. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. What or who do you feel is the lost civilization destroyed in the last ice age? And will we meet the same fate, or are we on the cusp of making a great leap forward into an evolved consciousness? Well, I think, um, obviously, I've had a lot of time to think about this uh, this issue over over the years, since you know, since I first, I first proposed a, a huge forgotten episode in human history. Um, I, I do think that there was something worthy of the name a, a civilization back in what geologists and archaeologists now call the Upper Paleolithic, uh, the end of the last ice age, uh, and that and that um, that it that it uh, thrived, uh, I think, on coastlines. Um, I think it was primarily a maritime uh, civilization. I, I, I don't think it was a civilization very much like ours. Um, I suspect that our civilization has gone down the road of mechanical advantage very, very far. Um, we tend to want to manipulate matter using material solutions. This may have been a civilization that used the powers of the mind much more highly and much more effectively than, than uh, we do. Um, may have manipulated quantum states, may have uh, organized matter in an entirely different way. That's why, that's why we don't find 
you know, so much of the kind of material remnant that we would expect to be associated with a civilization because we've not yet got to grips with the idea that a thing worthy of the name of being called a civilization could have taken a very different form from the one that we are used to, uh, to today. Um, I do think it was seagoing. Uh, that's, that's for me, one of the key, the key elements of it, um, and that, that it planted its seeds uh, all around the world as a result of that. I do think that the world was um, mapped. Uh, I think there's just overwhelming evidence for that, and I've published that in Fingerprints of the Gods, and much more detail also in, in Underworld, that, uh, that there are too many ancient maps that have survived. Uh, and it's tempting, it's, it's tantalizing, because what survived is not the original map. What survived is a copy of an older map. The source maps have not survived. But on these, but on these copies, there's too much data. Piri Reis. The Piri Reis map is one of the best known. Um, but there are just dozens, if not hundreds, of maps which actually very precisely uh, demarcate areas of the world as they looked during the last ice age. And it's mm. only in the last, you know, 50 years that we've had the technology to know what the world looked like mm. during the last ice age. When I was researching Underworld, I was lucky enough to work with a chap called Glenn Milne at the University of Durham in the north of England. And he and his geologist, I'm not sure if he's still at Durham or if he's moved on, he and his team um, had developed an incredibly sophisticated c com computer simulation of global sea levels uh, over the last 30,000 years based on all the available data. You know, that data can include coral die-offs. There are certain corals that only thrive at a particular depth beneath the surface. If you increase the depth above them, they die. Uh, and from that, you can say, well, there was a flooding event at, at such and such a time. There's, there's the fact that uh, land masses pressed down upon by huge ice caps are actually pushed down uh, into the Earth's crust. And when the ice caps melt, those land masses rebound. It's called isostasy. All of these factors need to be taken into account when you consider sea level rise and how the world may have looked in different periods. And Glenn and his team have got, really got the most fantastic computer model where you can dial in any coastline anywhere in the world in the last 30,000 years and see how it looked. And it's amazing how many features actually pop up on those ancient maps, you know, right down to tiny details like a little island off the coast of Ireland uh, that appears on Ptolemaic maps that were drawn from ancient coordinates in the 14th or 15th centuries. Um, bear it, I, I repeat, drawn from ancient coordinates. And that those and, and those maps show an island in exactly the place where an island existed until 12,000 years ago, at which time it was submerged by rising sea levels. There's so many examples of this that I think it only ta it, it it requires a really dogged commitment to the mainstream paradigm to ignore it. But that's what's happened. Those those maps have largely been ignored and dismissed as coincidences or anomalies, but not as not as actual. For me, they're they're evidence that there was a global a global maritime civilization which mapped the world. And I think, I think that it drew a meridian through the earth. I think that the, the, the ancient prime meridian ran through Giza. It's the zero point. And I think that there were sites all around the world that were marked off at significant longitudes in relation to that zero point. Um, and those sites may have continued to be sacred long after their original purpose was, uh, was forgotten. And those significant longitudes all involve the numbers that are implicated in the precession of the equinoxes, which unfolds at the rate of one degree every 72 years. Uh, so you find an ancient world grid uh, based on those on significant numbers of degrees of longitude. What, what approximate year do you feel that was constructed? I think it was done after the cataclysm. I think there was, I think there was an attempt to remap the world after the cataclysm. Uh, I think that uh, I, I think there were survivors, and I think that uh, <clears throat> again, somewhere between thirteen thousand and twelve thousand years ago, and perhaps soon after, a radical cataclysm shook the earth. There was an attempt to re-establish things, to remap the things, and, and that attempt ultimately failed. But but there was but the traces of it are left. I think. I think that's what happened. There's so many examples of geologists and archaeologists losing their job because they found uh, an artifact in, in a non-disrupted strata that dates to hundreds of thousands of I years know, ago. Yeah. Uh, do, do you think, I mean, what, what, what underwater site featured in Underworld or one you've learned about since do you think is going to create acceptance that sophistication of civilization 
goes back far longer than we believe it does. Well, I mean, luckily with Gobekli Tepe, we already got one above water, mm. you know, which is, mm. t- t- you know, I, 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 what I was arguing in, in Fingerprints of the Gods was, evident, was evidence for a sophisticated civilization 12,000 or more years ago. Um, and Gobekli Tepe already provides us with, um, you know, really incontrovertible evidence of the existence of such a culture, which had developed its stoneworking techniques to such a degree that it cre- could create a site on that scale. And uh, doesn't it appear to be an observatory? Nobody knows what it is. I, nobody's certain what it is. It does, it does seem to be in a place with a good 360-degree horizon around it, which is, which is very good for um, astronomical uh, observations. Um, but as far as I know, there's no, there's no settled conclusion on, on what it is. And I think, I think more is going to need to be found. There are many other pot-bellied hills in that area which are covered up. There may be many more sites uh, of, that, of that kind which wait to be explored. And this is one of the... One of the issues that I intend to do work on in the future, I've I've come to feel, you know, as you said, fingerprints was fingerprints of the gods was published um, seventeen years ago. Um, I took the work a lot further with Underworld, with the diving explorations, and there's one particular site. Well, there's more than one, but um, the underwater stone circle of Kerama in Japan uh, off the island of Okinawa uh, I think is a greatly underestimated site I think it's a site of tremendous importance it's a huge s- s- structure I've got pictures of it on my website because Santa and I, Santa's a photographer and she and I dived uh, together um, and we also filmed it um, it's 110 feet underwater. It's been underwater for 12 and a half, 13,000 years. It's a gigantic stone circle um, on a huge scale. And there's not just one. I mean, there's a whole range of them there. Really amazing, amazing place. And it would have involved vast amounts of work to to uh, create it. I think the uh, cities that have been detected with side scan sonar in the Gulf of Cambay, uh, off the northwest coast of India again, not followed up on, are very, very interesting. And, and were the resources to be there, um, I would want to do a whole lot more underwater work in that area and off southern India uh, as well, where we have a huge Atlantis tradition. Mm. I mean, the Sangam tradition of, of Tamil Nadu, which speaks of, uh, of a land called Kumari Kandam that stretched far, far to the south of the southern tip of India, is again borne out in Glen Milne's inundation maps. There was such a landmass. Sri Lanka was connected to mainland India, and it was all submerged in the last, uh, you know, around about 12,000 plus years ago. And can I ask where you place Atlantis and, and when? I place it everywhere. I, I think that um, I think it's important to <clears throat> it's important to not isolate the Atlantis story. Um, it isn't it doesn't stand alone. There are many such stories from many different cultures around the world, all essentially speak of the same thing, which was of a, a maritime seagoing civilization, highly advanced uh, in its abilities. Uh, which was cataclysmically destroyed very, very rapidly by huge earth changes. Um, and part of it was in the Atlantic, part of it was in the Indian Ocean, part of it was in the Pacific. It was a global civilization, and I think we have disparate memories of different bits of it. Uh, but for me, they're all Atlantis. And, and I, I don't think we should forget America itself. Uh, as uh, as a possible, you know, if we're looking for the one that specifically mm. is Plato's Atlantis, I mean, America is very very interesting, uh, and the hidden history of uh, of America and of what happened in America, and it is does appear to have been over North America <coughs> that this uh, gigantic comet of um, twelve thousand nine hundred years ago uh, exploded, creating, as I mentioned earlier, f- features like the Carolina Bays. Yes. That's that that yes. you know. So so I I think there's a I think there's a whole lot a whole lot of missing story to be recovered from the Americas. Well, and the, offshore the, the, the then Americas. Then we have the uh, the copper, uh, which is now uh, uh, a huge uh, mystery. A, yes, a, a, extremely um, traceable. Mm. Uh, the bronze to, to specific... of the ancient world goes right to Lake Superior. Exactly. Um, which is fascinating. So what does that what does that tell you about 
the people's ability to navigate um, either the sea or, or, or to submit to the Gulf Stream. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I just think that ancient seafaring skills are greatly underestimated. And I think there was a whole, there was a, there was a period when the world, and, 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 you know, when you have two mile deep ice caps sitting on top of land masses like the, the, the half of North America and almost all of Northern Europe, you know, the sea becomes a very effective way of getting around, you know, land, land routes are severely restricted and the, and the, and the interior of continents are very arid and very hostile um, places where, and I do think uh, again, it's you know this is this is often pointed out. We do have many traces of hunter gatherer peoples from that period. I don't see that as a contradiction. I think there were hunter gatherer pe- peoples in that period, and I think there was an advanced civilization as well, just as there is today. We have an advanced civilization today, uh, globally distributed, and we have hunter gatherers in the Kalahari, in the Amazon. You know, the the fact that that two different levels of culture coexist is not surprising to me. There's no doubt. There's been great civilizations have been decimated by by cataclysm. But the fact that Plato's Atlantis comes from what Solon and Crantor learned in Egypt and yeah. Sais, meaningful to you? Very meaningful, uh, especially because of the date that's put on it, you know, 9,000 years before the time of Solon, 9,600 BC. What, what if those priests were counting in solar years? Each month was a year. Well, I, I don't, I personally never seen the need for that. I've, I've, never, I've never seen the need uh, for that. At all. I, I mean, if they if they say it was nine thousand years before the time of Solon, um, well, that puts a smack bang in the end of the last ice age. I, if we I, if we if each month was a year, then then it's much less far back in time. If each month is a year, then it, it puts us right where science says Thera erupted, which is fascinating. Well, me. that's fascinating, and Thera Thera undoubtedly was was a gigantic uh, event that brought uh, that brought an end to some known historical civilizations. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, I I understand the case for, for saying that this was that this is what Plato's story was. About. And that's not to say that if uh, Plato's Atlantis was Minoan Crete, for instance, that there weren't many other greater, previously ancient civilizations yeah. who were also decimated. Sure, but I don't um, think we can have it both ways. I think that I think that you know Plato's Atlantis is either one or the other. Um, mm. And and what I find, what I find, I'm I'm totally open to the Minoan thing and Thera. I have no doubt that Thera changed the story massively, globally and in the Mediterranean. Um, But what I find compelling about Plato's story is is actually to take the time frame at face value. He, Plato, could not have known anything about Ice Ages. But 9,000 years before the time of Solon is 9,600 B.C., it's 11,600 years ago. And this is, you know, precisely the period mm. of the gigantic meltdown of the ice caps. Fits, the younger Dryas yeah. had, had, had yeah. kicked in and gone away again by then. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it, it fits per- perfectly with that. It also fits with what you would expect ancient Egyptian priests to be telling you because the ancient Egyptians preserve um, uh, many records which speak of earlier times, going back thousands tens of thousands of years, in some cases 30,000. What I struggle with, I've never seen that any inscriptions talk about any ancient culture, let alone um, one more advanced than theirs. Not so, at all. So not, not at all. Go to Edfu. Go, go, go. But go. I mean, on the, the outside. What would go read the Edfu building text, which, which, um, uh, which tell us that they are the copy of an earlier document. Of course, the Temple of Edfu in its present manifestation is a Ptolemaic temple. Mm. Um, no older than 2,200 years or so. It was about 200, 300 BC at the oldest. Mm, mm. But uh, but when it was built, an ancient document existed, uh, which contained certain texts, um, and those texts were faithfully inscribed on the walls. And when you read those texts, they do speak of a former civilization. They do speak of an island on which the gods dwelled. They do speak of a flood. Um, and they they do speak of survivors who come to Egypt and establish the primeval mounds that are to be the sites of all future temples uh, in 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 Egypt. So you know I think the Edfu building texts are are exactly that. They're they're. It's a, it's a great answer. I I had not thought of them in that context, and I have wondered why if both Solomon and Krantor were shown the same pillars that recounted the same story, 
Sais was not any more ancient than other Iranian temples in Egypt. Why don't we see it? But we do. Well, we do. Uh, not only the Epic Building Text, but also in any king list, um, the at Abydos, the 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 king list, the where where you see uh, Seti the uh, first showing his son Ramesses the second the list of all the pharaohs who reigned before them. That they go back to the dawn of the historical era, and then they just go on back and back and back and back and back, actually 30,000 years back uh, into the into the past. Uh, and uh, these are the time of the gods. This is the time of the followers of Horus. This is the, the, the period that the Egyptians called Zeptepi the first time, which Egyptologists would like us to believe is entirely mythical. In other words, Egyptologists cherry-pick the king lists. They say the period of the king lists that relates to what we know of as history, i.e. from 3000 BC onwards, we accept that as a useful guide to the story of the pharaohs. But everything else in the king's list, we regard that as mythical and having no meaning whatsoever. Yeah. Well, I don't think that's a logical position. Exactly. Yeah, your book, The, the Sign and the Seal, um, kind of introduced you to a, a, a much wider audience from an from alternative history, esoteric perspective. It, it was a wonderful treatment of the history of the Ark of the Covenant and uh, its possible existence in, in Aksum, uh, Ethiopia to this day. W- what do you think would happen if the Ark was to be rediscovered today? What would the political ramifications be? I've had reason to think about this um, re- recently. Uh, it, it's just a fact, and it's a rather spooky one, that um, the three uh, mainstream monotheistic faiths, uh, Islam, particularly in its Shia manifestation, uh, Judaism and Christianity, uh, all have fundamentalist elements which all make reference to the Ark of the Covenant. Um, for the, the, the character that the Shias call the hidden imam um, to return, and he, he, by the way, is the person who Iran, whose return Iran is actively preparing for now, um, the Mahdi, uh, whose name lies behind the name of the Mahdi army in Iraq, um, the hidden imam, the Mahdi, uh, must recover the Ark of the Covenant and return it to the Temple Mount uh, in Jerusalem before he can engage in what is seen in Shia tradition as the final battle of good against evil, which is interpreted in Iran as the battle of Shia Islam against the forces of the West and Judaism. Right. The Ark of the Covenant is the recovery and retrieval of the Ark of the Covenant, and its return to the Temple Mount in Jerusalem is, is a is the key, is the key that turns that process on the process of Judgment Day or of the end of the world. It's the same for fundamentalist uh, Judaism. There are groups such as, for example, the Temple Mount faithful in uh, Israel who are intent on building the third temple on the Temple Mount. Um, and who would like to sweep away the monuments of Islam, the uh, Al-Aqsa Mosque and the Dome of the Rock, uh, and and make it a site of fundamentalist uh, Zionism. They too require the Ark of the Covenant uh, in order to realize that that apocalyptic dream, which they too see as the precursor to the end of the world. And fundamentalist Christians... um, make reference to the book of Revelation where one of the signs of the day of judgment is the reappearance and return of the Ark of the Covenant. Mm. So actually in a weird kind of way this this uh, ancient object that disappeared from the human story some 2,600 years ago um, were it to be recovered today uh, could become a catalyst for some of the most extreme and ghastly apocalyptic visions that it's possible to imagine Mm. uh, and would undoubtedly be used as such by any one of those three groups that I've mentioned, whether whether I speak of fundamentalist Christians, fundamentalist Jews or fundamentalist uh, Muslims. uh, For all of them, the access and control of that object would be would undoubtedly be used as 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 a catalyst for uh, a cataclysmic struggle. Uh, so uh, I think it's really good thing if the art just stays away from history for a while. Um, the the uh, one of the I mean it's interesting that the Ethiopians say that 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 um, the art came to Ethiopia because God wanted it to be there. 
and that and, and that it's there to be hidden away and it needs to be hidden away and that they've been entrusted with keeping it hidden um, and and in an odd kind of way that's the best thing they could do for the world is to keep the ark hidden and not return it into public discourse again it would be a it would be a very bad thing if the ark were brought out into the world today. Unfortunately, with fun, with fundamentalist religious views, which are which are cataclysmic by nature and which are based on hatred, based on exclusivity, based on the notion that this group has total control of the truth and all other groups must be destroyed, they they don't need that much proof. You know, mm. they just need a catalyst, yeah. something that can yeah. symbolically activate these atavistic energies, mm. and they will swing into motion anyway. And and you know, while any reasonable person uh, would disagree with and detest fundamentalist religious sympathies, uh, the they are a factor in the world that we live in today, a huge factor, which are which are directly affecting everybody's everyday life. So we can't just close our eyes to these things. They are they are real. They are they are they are a real part of the human discourse today. What? Even though even though they're based on the most hateful and wicked idea. And there's a lot of detail about how it looked and what it was constructed with yeah, yeah. to sort of reconstruct it. You, you've got some things to go on. Yes. Um, oh, to, indeed. To yes. serve as that catalyst. Oh, totally. I mean, totally. Scary, the Book of Exodus gives a very um, detailed blueprint. Supernatural. Mm. What role do you feel psychedelics have played, uh, hallucinogenics, in the evolution of human consciousness, imagination, and religion? And is there a place for them in our world today? Just as it's um, impossible to understand uh, ancient civilizations without getting into astronomy, I think it's impossible to understand ancient civilizations without getting into altered states of consciousness, uh, which can be brought about by a variety of different means, uh, of which the most widely used and the most um, uh, reliably effective uh, are the visionary plants. Uh, but there are other techniques and methods for getting into deeply altered states of consciousness. So I would put the emphasis first on altered states of consciousness rather than on psychedelics. Psychedelics are simply a vehicle for bringing about the requisite altered state of consciousness. So something like drumming could be a substitute. Drumming, uh, rhythmic, rhythmic dancing, uh, certain forms of music. Fasting has a long and honorable tradition mm. for bringing on altered states of consciousness mm. and contact with the uh, divine. Mm. Um, there really are there really are meditation. I mean, there really is a huge range of, of techniques. People get very holier and thou about this, and they say, we achieve altered states of consciousness through meditation. This is the only pure way to do it. Anybody who uses psychedelics is, um, is not authentic. I think that's absolute bullshit. I think that all of these techniques are authentic, and anybody who's deeply committed to one technique should not despise other techniques, mm. all of which have an mm. ancient heritage, uh, or, or, or all of which are deeply thought out and have been and have been used with great responsibility and care by ancient civilizations and existing shamanic cultures to this to this day. Um, it's uh, a fact that you know to live in the physical world. With the laws of physics, uh, we do primarily need to be in the alert, problem-solving state of consciousness, the everyday state of consciousness. This is, uh, it has a real place, it's very valuable, uh, and were we to become permanently detached from it, we could not function in this physical realm. Um, and we are here to function in this physical realm. It's part of our responsibility. That's partly why we chose to live in this realm. We, you know, so the, there is a definite place for the alert problem-solving state of consciousness. The, the problem with modern society is that it has deified that state of consciousness. It has said, mm. this is the only valid state of consciousness. There is no other valid state of consciousness. Of course, mainstream society does tolerate certain drugs. Um, it does allow people to use alcohol. In fact, it encourages people to use alcohol. Basically, you have your alert problem-solving state of consciousness for the everyday action of getting and spending, and you have your alcohol for blissing out and relaxing from that state of consciousness. So it's the, uh, alcohol in, is the drug that's the other side of the coin to the mainstream approval of the alert, alert problem-solving state of consciousness. It allows people to alter their consciousness uh, in a way that gives them a little holiday from that, and then they can re return to it. Uh, I mean, to my mind, alcohol is one of the most boring uh, and useless drugs on the face of the planet. But uh, it, 
it does have this holiday function that allows people to take a brief respite from the tyranny of the alert problem-solving state of consciousness. And, and because it doesn't threaten the alert problem-solving state of consciousness, well, admittedly some people become alcoholics and become dysfunctional, but by and large it doesn't cause people to question the existing model. Uh, it's tolerated and, uh, and accepted by, by, by mainstream uh, society. But there are other agents uh, that, that in, induce radically altered states of consciousness, which, which not only allow you to step out of the alert problem-solving state of consciousness, but also almost inevitably lead you to question uh, the fundamentals of life in the material realm and, and indeed the nature of reality itself. And, and those, uh, those agents include powerful visionary plants, such as um, the, the brew called ayahuasca in the Amazon, which consists of two things. It consists of um, the vine, um, uh, Banisteriopsis carpi, uh, and it consists of the leaf of a bush called, the, the, the botanical name is Cicotria viridis. Uh, it's called Chacruna in the Amazon, and the vine is called Ayahuasca in the Amazon. The leaves um, contain um, pharmacologically pure dimethyltryptamine, DMT, which is, of course, uh, a highly illegal drug uh, throughout the West, and indeed throughout the world. Uh, it's a Schedule One drug in the United States, and it's a Class A hallucinogen in the in the UK. And, and you can go to prison for a very long time for for using DMT. Um, DMT uh, cannot be um, activated orally normally, um, and that's why people who um, experiment with with pure DMT in the West, uh, have to smoke it. Uh, you can you can smoke DMT. DMT can be synthesized um, and it, and it can be derived from certain plants. But if you consume it orally, it will ha not have any effect on you. And that's because of an enzyme in our stomachs called monoamine oxidase, which switches DMT off. Um, but if you smoke it, uh, DMT will have uh, a very radical, very rapid uh, effect. Um, and DMT is probably the most powerful hallucinogen known to man. Um, I've personally had um, 11 journeys with pure uh, smoked DMT. Uh, and what happens with DMT is that it, um, it hits you within about a tenth of a second uh, of the first inhalation. Um, and uh, w within two to three seconds, uh, it plunges you mercilessly uh, into a completely alien realm, which is which is as much disconnected from this realm as it's possible to imagine, um, and and which as a result can be can be utterly terrifying, or not. It doesn't have to be terrifying. It isn't always terrifying, but it, the the sheer strangeness of it can be extremely disorienting and, uh, and disturbing. But the good news is that you're only in that realm for 12 to 15 minutes. Right. And then, whoosh, you come back to your alert problem-solving state of consciousness. With a lot to think about. Is there a sense of time while you're in that state? Not really. Not really. It, 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 it's partly dose-dependent. If, if, if you've had a good hefty dose, you can totally lose connection to this realm, and, and you really... All you can really do is just lie down. The, the, you, you, you've, you've ceased to function phys physically. Um, and, and you undergo a very, very p powerful mental experiences, which, which um, quite beyond the extraordinary clockwork geometry, the, the, the sense of an intricately fashioned geometrical realm filled with, with seething deeply enriched colors and, and patterns. Quite beyond that, it includes um, direct t telepathic contact with intelligent entities. Th this is where anybody who hasn't smoked DMT will say, you must be nuts, mate, to even talk about stuff like that. But I would ask anybody who hasn't worked with DMT, and I'll come on to ayahuasca in a moment, where DMT is the active ingredient. Uh, I would ask anybody who hasn't worked with these substances to just withhold judgment until they do because you really need to have this experience in order, to, in order to get to grips with it. It's not something that you can 
study intellectually. You can study it intellectually, but it just doesn't do the trick. Um, Dennis McKenna, you know, rightly says that DM DMT and, and ayahuasca are the ultimate skeptics challenge because actually what you're dealing with is an experience there and that experience is overwhelming uh, and it's overwhelmingly convincing. And when the intellectual comes to you and says, your brain has made that all up, I'm afraid you as the experiencer tend to reject that because it's so intricate and it's so detailed and it's so compelling that you just can't imagine how your brain could have made that all up. It's much more like a contact with another level of reality. Uh, and with um, intelligent entities which, which use the opportunity of your altered state of consciousness to communicate with you, um, I, I, I do know that to people who haven't worked with this, how crazy this sounds. I do, I do understand that, but I would, I would say that uh, just withhold judgment until you've had the experience, because when you've had the experience, it won't sound so crazy anymore. Um, intelligent entities who communicate with you. Now, the interesting thing about the DMT realms, and, and Terence McKenna has, I think, done more than, and I really want to pay tribute to that, C courageous and brilliant psychonaut, psychonaut that, that incredibly gifted speaker, that gift from the universe to mankind that was Terence McKenna, who, you know, we sadly lost, but who brought, who just brought contact with these realms that, that, to, to levels that everybody can understand through his incredible, powerful, his voice, his ability to express verbally the mm. unexpressible, I think mm. is better than, than anybody that, 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 that I know. There is something oddly, and most people who've worked with DMT will agree with this, there is something oddly almost mechanistic or technological about DMT realms. Mm. Um, it's very odd and very strange. People across ma many different cultures and backgrounds will, will share this experience. Something, something mechanical about it, uh, like a robot world. Uh, Rick Strassman's research at the University of New Mexico um, is key in this respect because it's provided a thorough dossier of modern documentation. R Rick Strassman, um, in the late 1990s, delivered DMT to a group of volunteers at the University of New Mexico. I believe there were 50 or 60 volunteers. And over a period of four years, they were given a lot of DMT. They didn't smoke it, they was injected. That's the other way to get it straight into the system. Mm. Um, and again, producing a 12 to 15 minute trip. Uh, and, and these volunteers all come back and they're reporting connections and contacts with the same realm. They aren't comparing notes, but they're all seeing the same, essentially the same things. And the sense of alien contact is very powerful, that there's so much in common between the, the realms that are encountered on a DMT journey and the realms that are reported by UFO abductees that you have to ask yourself what's going on here. And, and, and supernatural, correct me if I'm wrong, you, you cite that 2% of the world has DMT naturally triggered in, in their brain and 2% of the world have also seen a gray. Yeah, I, I think that there, I think that to, to my mind, and Rick, Rick Strassman explores this hy hypothesis in his work at the University of New Mexico, that likely what UFO abductees are, uh, are people who spontaneously overproduce DMT, because this is the one point that I haven't made yet, is that DMT is a natural brain hormone. Right. We're not sure which part of the brain it's, um, it, it's produced in, although it's been suggested it might be the pineal gland. Um, but it is a natural brain hormone, and it is found in all of us. Uh, if you assay anybody's blood or cerebrospinal fluid or urine, you will find traces of DMT and, and, and at sub-psychedelic levels. Um, so the suggestion that Rick made, and, and he was consulting closely with John Mack at Harvard University before John Mack was unfortunately killed by a drunk driver in London, um, the suggestion that he made is that UFO abductees may be people who spontaneously overproduce DMT, and it puts them into this state which you can artificially induce in others by giving them DMT, where they have these alien contacts. But it's really important to emphasize, and I have to make this absolutely clear, and it's really important that you run this in the interview if you do this, that this does not mean that those experiences are not real. This does not mean that those experiences are artifacts of the brain. What this does mean is that reality may be much more complicated than we imagine, and that what may be happening, and I believe John Mack was moving very much towards this idea as well before he was killed, that what may be happening with the UFO abductions, see, with UFO abductions we have a phenomenon, but we actually don't know what's causing it. It's very easy to jump to the conclusion that what is causing it uh, is 
technological, highly advanced beings a bit like us who have crossed interstellar space in amazing spaceships um, and are abducting us. That, that it's very easy to jump to that conclusion. Um, and it's part of the reason why in Supernatural I drew attention to the similarities of these experiences and fairy abductions in the Middle Ages and abductions by spirits of shamans today in hunter-gatherer societies. And old hag and things like that. All of that. these things. What I'm suggesting is that onto the experience we impose our cultural conditioning. Right. We happen to be a culture which is involved in the exploration of outer space. So it's a natural jump for us to say when, when we see something in a flying ship which, which um, uh, takes us up and does certain procedures on us and puts something in our brains, for example, that that is an alien being from the same universe as us, but just higher tech. Uh, Shaman sees it totally differently. He, he has the same experiences. He's abducted into a flying vehicle in the sky also. Um, he's laid down on a on a table. They perform operations on him. They insert crystals into his brain. He sees that as the work of the spirits because that's where his cultural conditioning comes from. Right. And when fairies did that to people in the Middle Ages, that was their cultural conditioning, seeing that. But the same experience in every case. One time they're called fairies. Another time they're called spirits. Today we call them aliens. But actually, none of us know what they are. My suggestion would be, uh, and I don't deny, by the way. And this is also important to make clear that there is a physical aspect to this experience. There are there are some bizarre physical traces which have been left in UFO abductions. Uh, there are uh, people with uh, implants, and some of these implants are really interesting as to as to what they are and what they may be. There have been traces on radar screens, very fleeting, very tantalizing glimpses of some object that actually enters the physical realm and manifests physically and then disappears again. But it's a very elusive, difficult thing. If I were to put money on this, as a, if I were a betting man and I were gambling, I would say what we're dealing with here is interdimensional contacts rather than just contacts in this dimension between high-tech and lower-tech beings. I think we're, I think we're dealing with, with, with the flying saucer may be a vehicle to cross dimensions. Uh, and that it may at times manifest into this physical dimension and may at, at times leave a physical trace, but that the primary way of accessing this is through consciousness. And, and that what, what is actually happening, and it goes back to the point I made earlier, that consciousness may not be generated by the brain, but may be um, uh, the, the, re received or transceived through the brain, uh, it therefore, rather like the TV signal, it therefore follows that, that you can alter the receiver wavelength of the brain. Uh, and that what these, um, and, 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 and when you alter the receiver wavelength, you pick up other signals. And those signals are real. They're not artifacts of the brain any more than a TV signal is an artifact of the TV set. Right. They're real signals, but you have to alter the receiver wavelength to pick them up, just as you have to alter the receiver wavelength of your TV set to pick up other channels. Uh, and that that's what the visionary plants are doing, that they're altering the receiver wavelength of the brain and allowing us temporary access to other levels of reality, which are normally excluded from our senses because we are so focused on this material realm. Uh, that we just can't gain access to them, and that, and you know, Huxley and others pointed out that the brain is primarily a reducing valve, that it exists to cut stuff out more than anything else, and that occasionally he he saw the the psychedelics as gratuitous graces that allowed us to loosen off the reducing valve a little bit and allow a bit more of reality in. In Canada, Dr. Persinger with the God Helmet, he can um, apply pressure to the frontal lobes, and people. Uh, will experience the alien abduction phenomenon. But what I hear you saying is that that doesn't lessen the fact that that is a real access to letting in of the, the true reality. Exactly. Like you, like Even you Persinger said. himself, who's pretty committed to the materialist paradigm, has admitted this on record, that he can't absolutely prove that the brain is making these things. Uh, that by altering, that he may be altering the receiver wavelength of the brain and, and allowing in a glimpse of another level of reality. Uh, even he, he himself has admitted that, and I think I cite it in Supernatural somewhere. Well, uh, um, the, 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 the what's going on with this with these magnetism is that it is another vehicle for altering the receiver wavelength of the brain, um, and and that therefore uh, these experiences that people have with his helmet on uh, may in fact be experiences of another level of reality, uh, just as as they may be with the, with the hallucinogens. So, um, just to, to, to sort of, I've gone off on a huge rambling discourse here, but yeah. to just to, to come back to the point, 
There you have DMT, which exists widely in nature. Uh, it exists uh, in many species of animals and plants. Uh, it's something... I, I actually would go, I would go so far as to say that part of the process of evolution has been to allow these back doors. It co-evolved with us have been certain plants that allow us to step out of the mainstream, you know, um, problem-solving, alert problem-solving mentality, because it's good for our evolution to step out of that. We, we, if we get locked into that, we become very narrow and rigid and limited, and we, and we, right. we stop making changes. We need to be able to step out from that. So there's DMT, and, and as I said, in pure form, only to be activated um, by smoking it or injecting it. The moment I use the word injection, I'm aware that many people who are ignorant and don't understand these things are going to start to think addictive drugs. It's important to be very clear, none of the hallucinogens are addictive, uh, and, and D DMT is not addictive. And as a matter of fact, the experiences are so overwhelming and so profound that it takes a huge effort of will to put yourself into the experience again. It's not something that you seek out. It's something that you prepare yourself for. It's like going into, um, it, it, literally going into another world, which is, which is so strange and so terrifying that you really have to brace yourself in order to, to, to go there. I'm not sure that I'll ever do another pure DMT experience. Um, uh, the, the, the effects have been so overwhelming. Um, but it, now, then now we come to ayahuasca. Ayahuasca is a brew. It's a drink. And there's a mystery in this in itself because the DMT is being delivered orally and it's working. And the reason that it's working is because of the ayahuasca vine. And the ayahuasca vine contains a monoamine oxidase inhibitor that switches off the monoamine oxidase in the stomach and allows the DMT in the Psychotria viridis leaves to be absorbed and to enter the, uh, to cross the blood-brain barrier and enter the brain. Now, when you bear in mind that there are 155,000 different species of plants and trees in the Amazon, it's a pretty amazing piece of uh, chemistry that the shamans in the Amazon found these two plants which, when put together and cooked with water, produce this uh, amazing brew that, that will give you, you see, I, as I said, pure DMT will give you a 12 to 15 minute journey. Ayahuasca will give you a four hour journey uh, into, those, into those realms gentler um, you have more control over it than you do with uh, with smoke DMT um, but even so at times it will take matters out of your hands uh, in the way that that pure DMT does and interestingly although DMT is the active ingredient there's something going on with the ayahuasca vine which modulates or mediates the experience so that the sense of entering a, a a mechanical, technological other world that is very, very common in the, the smoke DMT experience. It's a much more organic, flowing world that you enter with, uh, with ayahuasca. Uh, and, and serpents play a huge role in it. Um, this is uh, very, well, very well documented. It's, it's documented in great detail in um, Benny Shannon's book, as a matter of fact, which is called... Um, the Antipodes of the Mind, and Benny Shannon is the professor of psychology at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. He's done uh, three or four hundred ayahuasca journeys himself. Um, and he, what he's done is he's also documented the ayahuasca experiences of hundreds of people around the world from different cultures. And what he's found is that they all report seeing the same things, and that serpents are the most common thing. Whether you drink ayahuasca in the middle of Tokyo or the middle of the Amazon jungle, you are going to encounter intelligent, brightly colored serpents, which uh, have something to tell you, uh, and which um, may be terrifying, but more often are not terrifying. Um, and and uh, as any shaman will, will tell you, when the you know the 300 foot long serpent opens its jaws right in front of you, then what you have to do is just dive right in uh, and go into that process and see what and see what comes. About five years ago, I had um, what appeared to be a dream. It must have been a dream, but I knew it in front of me was a snake whose body was this big and his head was this big and I thought it was going to bite my head off mm -hmm. and it wanted me to, to interact with it mm -hmm. and I wouldn't 
opened my eyes. Yeah. I, I made it go away because I was so scared. Very common. I, I've had that experience too with uh, with ayahuasca, where I've where I've made these creatures go away. Um, except with ayahuasca, you do it the other way around. You do open your eyes, um, and that uh, happens? and that stops the vision usually, unless you're on a very 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 high dose. Um, it it will it will stop. Oh, it stops the vision. You come out of it. You come out of it. You come back into this space. Um, so you're supposed to keep your eyes closed. Yeah, with ayahuasca, the, your visionary experience will be stronger in a darkened room with your eyes closed. But when the, the serpent's in front of you and wants to engage with you, can you do that with your eyes closed? Yeah. You do it with your eyes closed, um, because you're you're in its realm and you're seeing you're seeing it. But if you get if you really get scared shitless, you can shut it out usually by opening your eyes, unless you've had a very large dose, in which case it'll still be there, whether you shut your eyes or open them. Wow, uh, it can it can still be there. Now now here's the curious thing with ayahuasca, uh, which is which again is universally reported, um, is the sense of connection and contact with an intelligence which we also find with pure DMT um, but in pure DMT those intelligences are a bit impersonal and quite um, mechanistic in their own in their own way it's like they're it's like they're machines have got a job to do on you um, but with ayahuasca there's a very personal uh, sense of a connection with a being um, who in a way is a being a bit like us but but vastly superior in her powers and, uh, and, and, and abilities. Many, sure. many people encounter this being as a woman uh, or as a female entity, very often as a serpent, usually as a serpent, but always understood to be, to be female. Not in every case. Some, some people construe her as male. For me, she's always been f- female. Um, and, and I've come to the feeling that many others have come that she's the mother goddess of this planet um, and that uh, her business is the planet. Uh, and that she um, does not operate in the material realm. Her only way to access the material realm is through human consciousness. And that's why right now, at this time of crisis, uh, ayahuasca is spreading all over the world, and it is being drunk in every major city in the world, and it's being encountered by tens of thousands of people all around the world, and every one of them is receiving a very curiously similar messages from ayahuasca. And those messages concern uh, the nature of the environment. They concern the terrible things that are being done to our jungles and to our oceans and to this beautiful gift that we've been given by the universe that we're destroying and the, the desperate need for a change of consciousness to stop that monstrosity happening. Um, and they concern our personal lives. Um, ayahuasca is regarded as a teacher in the Amazon. And uh, she will usually begin with uh, obliging you to ruthlessly review your own life and to will show you the impact that you have had on other people. In a visionary sense, you see this, the impact that you have had on other people over the whole course of your life and the pain and the damage and the hurt that you have caused that you may have totally justified to yourself at the time. Uh, but ayahuasca strips all of that away and obliges you to see yourself as you have been to others in reality, not as you imagined it to be. Um, and this, uh, as a result, many people find themselves in floods of tears during ayahuasca ceremonies because they have they they've they've realised that that far from being the nice, decent, loving person that they thought themselves to be, they've actually been rather toxic and selfish and greedy and cruel and unkind to others. And 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 so ayahuasca presents you with these truths about yourself. And it then hands the problem over to you. There it is. This is how you are, mate. What are you going to do about it? Next step is up to you. Um, and, and I have found these, uh, these teachings from, from ayahuasca uh, of incredible value to me uh, since I started working with ayahuasca in 2003. That it has definitely, um, gradually, uh, affected major changes in my life, um, which, which have... Um, uh, which have obliged me to confront negative and unkind aspects of my own behavior and to deal with them. And it isn't easy. This is the other thing that people who are not educated in this area don't understand. They think that by by taking a plant like this, you can't, you know, you can't imagine that you, you, you know, you get some sort of enlightenment just by drinking a plant. Well, you don't. Actually, what you get is you get shown the reality. 
And the work then follows. It's what you do with your own life. How do you integrate these experiences into your life? That's where the work comes. It's not enough just to drink the brew and have the experience. The question is, what do you then do next? Do you then start to make changes in your life, become a more positive person, or not? Um, if you don't, the next time you go back to ayahuasca, you're going to get a very rough ride. You know, this is uh, what they call uh, tough love. Uh, I, I do believe that there is a loving spiritual entity behind ayahuasca, but uh, that love can sometimes in, involve painful revelations to you about yourself. And, uh, and, and sooner or later, um, if you continue to work with the brew and take it seriously, but some people just walk away from it. But if you, take it, if you take it seriously and continue to work with it, you will start to make changes in your life. And you yes. will tend to become more helpful uh, and more nurturing towards others than you have been uh, in the past. Because you realize the consequences of your actions in a way that you didn't do uh, before. But it's a life's work. It takes a long time. A lifetime of bad habits are really hard things to change. We get ingrained in our habits and, and, and our ways of behavior, and we have a huge structure of, of ideas that justify them to ourselves. And, and changing that is is very, very difficult, long-term process. But I, I have noticed um, a, a, a change, changes in myself in this, in, in, in this respect, and I would say that I'm in the, in the process of the work. It is work that's involved here with, with ayahuasca. So it's curious that a mixture of two plants from the Amazon jungle cooked with water can, can require us to make profound psychological and behavioral changes in our lives uh, through what we realize. And it's why, um, as is quite well known, uh, ayahuasca has proved to be um, an incredibly successful agent in getting people off addictions to hard drugs. Uh, it's used at the Takiwasi Clinic in Peru, a um, place called Tarapoto, run by Dr. Jacques Mabit, um, as a therapy for heroin and cocaine addicts. Uh, uh, my understanding is that more than half of them leave the clinic uh, free of their addictions, never return to the addictions, do not suffer withdrawal symptoms. They've gone through a process of self-revelation uh, while drinking the ayahuasca, which has helped them to understand why they were addicted to that substance and the harm it was doing in their lives and in the lives of, of others. Um, and uh, it has been used, in, there's been an, uh, uh, some experiments in Canada with using ayahuasca with drug addicts, but unfortunately the Canadian government has stepped in and stopped it because they blindly see ayahuasca as yet another drug. Um, in, it is probably the most effective and the most powerful uh, anti-addiction agent uh, in the world, and the and the the control of addiction comes through revelation, through the realization of the individual that they are making a mistake in their lives. And I and and I speak from a direct experience in this matter. I'm not simply reporting uh, something that's in the literature, uh, because um, I had until October 2011 uh, a 24-year uh, non-stop uh, marijuana habit. Um, it was a very central part of my life, and there was a time in my life when smoking marijuana was, I believe, helpful to me, uh, extremely helpful, and helped to uh, helped to open me up to to uh, other possibilities. I first started smoking marijuana in 1987, and that was around about the time that I started to open up to the sign and the seal and the idea that, that the ideas that led me into the whole inquiry into ancient civilizations. I actually don't believe I would ever have done that if I hadn't uh, encountered marijuana at that time. Mm. Um, but I went on with it, uh, and I think I think that in, with with all these plant allies, uh, it's important that you establish your relationship with the plant correctly. Uh, and in recent years, um, certainly post the year two thousand, I think my relationship with marijuana transformed from being one of responsible use to one of abuse, uh, in which uh, in which I was literally y using marijuana latterly taken in through a vaporizer rather than smoked uh, from nine o'clock in the morning until two o'clock the next morning every day of the week seven days a week you know four weeks a month 52 weeks a year just const constant round the clock uh, consumption of marijuana and uh, in the latter years it's interesting that when I first started drinking ayahuasca in 2003 uh, at that point, I think marijuana was not harmful in my life, and it was it was still a positive agent, and ayahuasca never addressed the issue at all. Hmm. Um, but in the latter years, uh, it became more and more of a problem. 
Um, it made me increasingly uh, paranoid and unreasonable and distrusting. Um, and thus, instead of opening me up, it began to close me down. Uh, and it reached a point where it wasn't serving me anymore. And I wasn't prepared to recognize that. I was told by, me by many people that, that something had changed in my behavior and that it wasn't good. Uh, but I wouldn't listen. I was, I was just sure that, you know, this major, major, major use of marijuana was a very important fundamental part of my life. And I felt actually I couldn't write without it. Uh, but when I went to Brazil uh, in October 2011 and had five uh, ayahuasca sessions, they dealt directly and specifically with my marijuana habit. The whole five sessions were focused on that, and I was shown myself as a man who was poised on the edge of the abyss and whose, uh, and whose behavior had become uh, unkind and unhelpful to others around me and that I wasn't seeing it because of the... the place that I was in with, with marijuana. Uh, and it, uh, it filled me with, um, well, it, I didn't believe that I could stop smoking marijuana because it had become such a central part of my life. But there was a part of me was aware that I had taken it too far mm. and that, that, that the relationship with the plant had gone wrong. I want to be very clear here, I'm not putting down marijuana and I'm not putting down marijuana smokers. I believe that marijuana is a wonderful healing agent. I think it has a hugely important role to play in the world. But like any powerful medicines, mm. it's important to get your own balance right with that plant. And so please, if you put this in your interview, please put this element of it into, I am not putting marijuana down. And, and marijuana has at times played an incredibly important healing, wonderful and positive role in my life. Mm. But I went too far. Uh, and I got out of balance with the plant. And strangely, miraculously, mysteriously, ayahuasca involved itself in that during the five sessions that I had in Brazil in October 2011. And when I came back to England in the latter half of October 2011, I could not smoke marijuana anymore. So, so that, that event was less than a year ago? Less than a year ago. I literally was unable to smoke it anymore. I just couldn't. I, I was filled with such horror and such revulsion that a 24-year non-stop marijuana habit was stopped literally overnight, and it was stopped as a result of experiences that I had with ayahuasca. So when I say that ayahuasca can help people with unhelpful addictions, and I think I had become involved in an unhelpful addiction myself at that point, I'm speaking from experience. Wow, that's, that's a fantastic story. I really appreciate the, uh, the, the honesty. Um, I think well, it, has many, it has many uses and benefits, and I, and I want to reiterate that, that I have, a, I have a lot to be grateful to marijuana for. Uh, but I think after 24 years of non-stop, mm -hmm. very massive use of it, I'd reached a point where I needed to stop. And I wasn't prepared to admit that to myself, and, and ayahuasca turned that corner for me and helped me to see it in a very graphic way that I was in, in some kind of serious jeopardy if I didn't stop. And I've been, and I've been very glad that I did. I've, uh, it's, it's, it's helped me in lots and lots of ways since, since I stopped. What risk are we facing of, of losing ayahuasca given what's happening uh, in the Amazon? None. Um, this is another myth about ayahuasca. The myth is that, um, the myth is that uh, one of the myths is that, well, okay, there's two issues here. They're firstly, what's happening in the Amazon, uh, which is global industrial society impacting in, a, in an evil and wicked way on um, the fundamental uh, spiritual and environmental resource of our planet, uh, and secondly, there's the issue of what's called ayahuasca tourism. And many people who are against ayahuasca say that the Westerners flooding into the Amazon to drink ayahuasca are going to cause depletion of ayahuasca resources and that the plant will, will vanish from the world. N nothing could be further from the truth. The more uh, interest that is being shown in ayahuasca by Westerners, the more it's being planted. Ayahuasca can be planted. Um, and not only planted in the Amazon, planted all over the world. Right. Um, so actually, uh, uh, actually, uh, by the powerful and useful experiences that ayahuasca delivers to those who um, experience it, um, it is leading to its self-propagation all over the world. Uh, and, and there's more ayahuasca available in the world today than there ever was uh, in, in the past. Um, uh, and I also think, it's again, it's important to emphasize, because people have such knee-jerk reactions to drugs, um, 
don't anybody imagine that ayahuasca is some kind of recreational kick or drug, because it isn't. Uh, drinking ayahuasca is very hard work. Uh, it, is, it has a foul taste, it makes you vomit, it gives you diarrhea, uh, and it puts you through profound psychological experiences, which can be quite traumatic and which really can oblige you to confront the truth about yourselves. Not to speak of, and I haven't spoken yet, of the encounters with other realms and other entities and other dimensions of reality, which ayahuasca also opens up for you. All of this uh, requires an effort of will. Uh, and, and it is not something that you get addicted to. It is not something that you, you know, feel an urge to keep on doing again and again. It's something that you may say to yourself, I need to do this again, and I have to prepare myself spiritually and mentally and psychologically for what is going to be a, a, a very difficult adventure. Mm. Um, you know, so it, it's, it's, it's hard work to, to drink ayahuasca. Do, do, you, do you think that in... Um I'll call it initiation, or the the exposure to it should be mandated. <laughs> I don't think it should. Be, I don't think it should be mandated. Except I sometimes jokingly suggest that that anybody who runs for high public office should be required to undergo ten or a dozen ayahuasca sessions first. Uh, it will definitely sort out the sheep from the goats at that point. Um, this is one thing that that ayahuasca definitely does, um, and and. Um, Generally speaking, once once somebody has been through a series of ayahuasca sessions, it, it uh, addresses the ego, it knocks the ego back, it makes them want to be more nurturing and helpful, it makes them feel more responsible towards the environment. I think it would be a really good thing if every head of state had 10 ayahuasca sessions before they got there. Of course, some people are so are so committed to a particular paradigm that even ayahuasca might not shake them out of it. But it's a very powerful agent. Um, and and uh, and its power should not be underestimated. It really can bring about radical changes in people's lives, uh, as it's done in mine. So we were talking about supernatural, and we kind of went off again into a into a large dig digression. But I hope uh, it's been to the point. There are other visionary agents. There are psilocybin mushrooms, mm. very very interesting, widely widely available. And I addressed in supernatural the point that psilocybin mushrooms have certainly been available in Europe for tens of thousands of years, as well as in North America. They weren't brought in from North America after contact, as some people have suggested. Um, and probably they were the primary agent uh, in um, the inspiration that lay behind cave art. Um, and, and, of course, uh, Amanita muscaria, uh, back to America's the peyote, uh, peyote cactus. We have many, many different uh, agents. Uh, and I think the key point that I need to make um, is that there seems to have been, this is what I was getting to with Supernatural, uh, is that it seems to have been the encounter with visionary plants and visionary substances that shook humanity out of um, many millions of years of stasis uh, into a new creative mode. Mm. Um, and that's why I think it's dangerous for our society today to seek to deny us these experiences. I think that if our society were wise, uh, it, would, um, it would seek to facilitate these experiences in a responsible and caring manner. Legalize them. Le legalized, uh, but it, it, what's re it's really essential, I think what people really have to get, is that powerful psychedelics are not about recreation. Right. If people use psilocybin as a recreational drug, they are making a mistake. It right. can be used that way, but it's a mistake. It's right. not how it should be used. It involves disrespect to the plant, uh, and it involves definite dangers. Uh, what, what, is, what is required is a calm, serious mindset uh, in a setting where you feel completely safe, where there are others who will look after you if you need to be looked after. Uh, total you know responsibility is required adult responsibility and again and again that's where that's my main beef with the state is that the state mm. seeks to deny our adult responsibility the state says we will make these decisions for you regardless of what you think and that's why i regard the um the illegalization uh, the, the, the criminalization of the use of, of, of psychedelics is deeply fundamentally wrong. Uh, because what the state is saying there, actually, if you cut it down to bare essentials, what the state is saying is you as an adult may not take responsibility for your own consciousness. That is a very dangerous precedent to set. Mm. Very dangerous. It's far more dangerous than controlling freedom of speech. Mm. If you tell adults that they cannot undergo 
private and personal experiences that have no impact on others, but that are totally to do with their own exploration of their own consciousness, if you take that right away, then you've taken away the most fundamental human right of all, which is the right to sovereignty over consciousness. Um, if we do not have sovereignty over consciousness, we don't have sovereignty over anything at all. Every other freedom is illusory if that freedom is removed. Uh, and and the res responsibilities uh, like that um, come inevitably with some pain and risk. Mm. Uh, we have to tolerate that. You know, we are capable as a society of, of tolerating... Um, uh, of saying it's fine for somebody to climb a mountain on ropes or to jump out of an airplane. There are risks in those experiences, which also impact on consciousness in all sorts of mm. w ways. Uh, but, but somebody may not impact their consciousness uh, in an ancient and time-honored way using visionary plants. If we say that, we are definitely, as a society, saying you as an adult cannot be responsible over your consciousness. We as the state make that decision for you, and this is fundamentally wrong. It's a deep abuse of human rights. Uh, and and um, I, I think this particular dimension has not entered the debate on the war on drugs enough, that ultimately it's a war on consciousness. It's, uh, it, it, it's a war on consciousness, it's a war aimed at maintaining a particular state of consciousness and, and denying all other states of consciousness except those like alcohol drunkenness that are uh, tolerated by the, uh, by, by the regime. And the next step to, to human freedom, and I think it's a much more important step than many might realise, uh, is to move forward to societies that will uh, allow and nurture the exploration of altered states of consciousness, rather as Aldous Huxley envisaged in his amazing novel, uh, Island, uh, where, where, where this is understood to be a vital rite of passage uh, and where experiences can be had that can profoundly and positively affect the, in, the entire rest of our lives, but done so in a nurturing, positive, responsible setting. That's what has to be provided. And making these substances illegal uh, creates negative, dangerous, unhealthy settings in which they are uh, explored. Because the urge to alter consciousness is very deep, and, and it will happen no matter what rules exist in society. But as a society, we could, make, we could make the whole thing so much better and so much more helpful for people. And I think it would, it would perhaps allow the next step of evolution in human behavior, just as I believe it did 35, 40,000 years ago when our ancestors started experimenting with these plants and, and, and entered suddenly into the realm of symbolism and art and, and spiritual, spiritual beliefs, we too have got locked into a rigid technological framework. We're very good at technology, we have lots of different technologies, but we are still on a rigid path. And that path is proving to be self-destructive and we need to step out of it. And these ancient plants are there to help us to do that. And we shouldn't fear that as a society. We should, we should embrace it and responsibly use it to, to move us forward to the next stage. So, so, so tell me about your upcoming The Origins of Consciousness and Exploration in the Psychedelics, Spirituality and Ancient Civilizations Tour of Australia with Dennis McKenna and Mitch Schultz. How did that come about and what does it seek to uh, explore? Well, um, so I, um, I know uh, Mitch Schultz personally we've met several times and i've talked many times with dennis over skype but we haven't met personally yet we have many many mutual friends um and uh three of us have a lot of mutual interests um and i think the the tour originated with mitch schultz actually and a trip that he made to uh, australia where the idea came up of of putting together our similar and diverse interests uh, into into a series of uh, talks and events that will be given uh, across Australia, and I'm enormously looking forward to it. I'm looking looking forward to meeting and getting to know Dennis, who, who's a man I hugely admire uh, and whose work I think is incredibly important. Um, and uh, it's always fun to hang out with Mitch, uh, and we'll explore some radical ideas and uh, share those, you know, hopefully with with uh, groups of people in in Australia and hopefully get some constructive debate and, uh, and discussion uh, go, go, going on. I think, you know, consciousness is key to, to, to all of this. That's, that's where I see, we were talking about 2012, that's where I see the best hope and the big change coming. And I see it being born everywhere in the world today, is that there is a new state of consciousness poised on the edge of birth. And we need to do everything we can to help manifest that state of consciousness and bring it into bring it into reality it's small at the moment but it's growing 
and more and more people are drawn to it, not happy anymore with the, the destructive, controlling, cruel, hard-edged viciousness of the existing state of consciousness. Um, but but rather, um, you know, moving moving forward into a into a new state of consciousness where possibilities that have previously been impossible to envisage are open to be envisaged. So I hope that that's what this tour will have, uh, you know, will play some part in play some part in doing, bringing us together with like-minded people uh, in Australia. And and I've never really travelled in Australia before, so I'm looking forward to that as well. This is your first trip to Australia. I've been there before, but I haven't really done. Uh, I haven't really travelled in this in this way. I went there. I went there once on a book tour. I was there for two or three days. It was a very short visit, and uh, I was exhausted already when I arrived. So, this will be a bit more laid back. Your most recent work, Entangle, has seen you delve into fiction. After such an illustrious catalogue of historical nonfiction, what prompted this shift in approach? Um, it was a number of things. I've I've always felt as a writer. And that's fundamentally what I am and what I have all, always been, even when I was a teenager writing poetry and songs, um, that I express myself through writing. Um, I've always felt that I want to stretch myself and not to get locked in a particular rut just because it works. Um, that I would like... I've been given this gift of life... I, I don't know how long I have left on this planet. As a matter of fact, none of us do. There's a random element to life. Uh, but in the time that I have, I would like to explore this gift that I've been given, just as, as somebody who you know is a sculptor might like to explore their abilities as, 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 a, as a sculptor. Mine is, mine is writing, and I want to... I want to exercise other muscles than the muscles I've been exercising in the past. And I've, I've, most of my writing life has been involved with non-fiction, whether as a journalist um, uh, or uh, writing books about historical mysteries. They've been, they've been non-fiction. And uh, I felt that I wanted, I, I did feel quite strongly that I wanted to try and see whether I could write fiction and whether I could bring anything useful to the table by writing fiction. I felt intuitively that there were certain ideas which were so extraordinary that they might be better accessed through the medium of fiction than non-fiction, because non-fiction brings a lot of baggage with it. Mm -hmm. And this baggage I've become very conscious of with my uh, books on lost civilizations. Uh, when I wrote Fingerprints of the Gods, I was coming from a place of freedom. Uh, I wasn't paying attention to critics. Uh, I was only interested in throwing myself into that mystery. Did you feel more pressure writing Underworld after the Horizon Much more, incident? much more. The, this is what happened to me as a writer as a result of the backlash to Fingerprints of the Gods, is that I began to feel, because I looked at the way that critics work, uh, and the way, that, the way that the mechanism of criticism works is to find any single weakness in an argument and insert the knife point into that and twist it, and by so doing, uh, to attempt to discredit the entire argument. Therefore, I began to, what I began to want to do was to bulletproof every argument. I, I felt that mm. in, in an underworld. I mean, great book. But, but 800 pages. I could feel the burden of justification and proof. Absolutely. There's no doubt um, about it. It, no, it. It hit me in a big way. Uh, that I, I realized that, uh, as I say, when I wrote Fingerprints of the Gods, that was not a factor in my consideration. My, my only factor was to make the strongest possible case I could. Uh, but in, um, in subsequent books, I began to realize more and more that anything I might say could be vitiated and destroyed unless I bulletproofed it. So this led me to write, instead of offensively, to write defensively, to think on every argument, how will this be attacked? What wall can I erect to stop that attack coming in? And that's not a nice way to write. I got, I got very exhausted in that defensive mode um, and began to feel, you know, do I want to go on doing this? I, I, the, the critical apparatus is out there. It's part of, it's part of reality. I can't ignore it. Um, and, 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 and it won't go away. But if I'm going to present stuff as non-fiction, 
then I have to grapple with that. And the grappling with it, it results in books like Underworld, which are eight or 900 pages long and have, you know, 2,000 footnotes and every argument is repeated and reinforced a dozen times so that nobody can find a way around it to and attack people it. still look for ways. Well, they still look for ways, but as a matter of fact, Underworld has been much less attacked than Fingerprints of the Gods because it's much less attackable, but it's much less readable as well and, and much less writable from the point of view of the writer. Um, much less fun to write. And, you know, part of life is also having fun. Uh, so so he, here I have a certain gift with words. I, I, I would not, you know, put it in any special place, but that's that's what I've come into the world with. And, um, and I wanted to explore that gift in different ways where I don't have to pay attention to, you know, this, this huge critical uh, apparatus which is out there to destroy all new ideas. Uh, and so it, it seemed to me that if, I, that if I were to go into the realm of fantasy adventure in writing, I could continue to explore extraordinary ideas, uh, but I needn't pay any attention to academic critics at all because, you know, hey guys, it's just fantasy, relax. Uh, that's the answer to all of, to all of those points. But then, secondly, there was the question: What would I write about, and um, and uh, how would I approach it uh, cre- creatively? And again, this is an, a- an area where some people no doubt think that I'm nuts. But I went to Brazil and asked Ayahuasca what to do with that, and uh, and I was that this was back in hmm, two thousand and. 2008 maybe um, I was given the story pretty much that I wrote of Entangled in a, in a series of ayahuasca sessions in, in Brazil Is that right? um, I, I asked for a story and I was, and I was given one I was, the, the essential elements at any rate that there would be uh, that the, the fundamental story would be about the battle of good against evil that there would be one that was clearly heroines f- f- female not, not male protagonists one would be living in the in the Stone Age, where I'd already, of course, been doing a lot of research on in in the book that I wrote, Supernatural, um, and the other in the Modern Age, and that they would be connected across time uh, in a in a battle of good against evil, um, and that Neanderthals would be involved. This was the other thing that I saw clearly. And this was what was weird about those visions, because because I was shown Neanderthals as a creative, caring, intelligent, loving beings um, who um, were very different, actually, from the kind of Neanderthals I described in Supernatural. Uh, in Supernatural, I didn't give the Neanderthals much respect. Mm. Um, I, I, I regarded uh, creativity and symbolism as the province entirely of anatomically modern humans. But Ayahuasca showed me a different picture of Neanderthals altogether, and that I expressed... Uh, in Entangled, um, where where we have, uh, in fact, it's the Neanderthals who who the humans call the uglies in Entangled who teach the humans how to paint, um, and they body paint. They don't paint on on cave walls, but they they teach they and and they they introduce human anatomically modern humans to to symbolism and creativity, and interestingly, re- this is one of the very puzzling things is that re- recent research on Neanderthals in the last three or four years since Entangled was published has, has actually manifested all of that. They're now understood to have been uh, creative, symbolic creatures, very nurturing and caring. Many examples... Musical. Musical, exactly. And, and I have my Neanderthals playing music in Entangled. Um, and, and many examples of, of elderly Neanderthals who, who had see, clearly suffered physical damage but had been cared for and nurtured by their communities. You can see this in the skeletal remains. All of this has come out in the last three or four years since I published Entangled. Um, I envisaged my Neanderthals as having red hair. That has also come out as a scientific fact since I published Entangled. And I envisaged um, uh, interbreeding between Neanderthals and anatomically modern humans. And that has also come out in the last, in the last few years. So in a weird way, by giving me this story and giving me this other perspective on the Neanderthals, which was quite different from the perspective I had employed in an earlier non-fiction book, uh, it was odd that just after that happened, I mean, nobody's noticed Entangled. It's totally disappeared as a book. Hardly anybody's read it. But... After I published that book, all of this information came out in the scientific domain, which supports every single proposition that I make about Neanderthals. As a result, ayahuasca was was right. Yeah, ayahuasca was right. <laughs> showing me, showing me stuff. So, so, and again, I need to emphasize: um, it's not surprising uh, that I, uh, as a creative writer, 
was was given something in my domain, the domain of writing, by ayahuasca. Uh, because exactly the same thing happens to people who are creative in other ways, uh, notably painters, artists in particular. Mm. Ayahuasca art is a huge global phenomenon at the moment. Mm. Um, whether we talk about M Martina Hoffman uh, in, uh, in, 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 in Boulder, uh, or whether we talk about Alex Gray uh, at the Chapel of the Sacred Mirrors in, in New York, both from are, are friends of mine, they have been powerfully influenced by ayahuasca in their art, and they would be the first to say this, that, that it has transformed their art, and that a new kind of art is emerging as a result of the experiences with, with ayahuasca. So one of the strange things that ayahuasca does is it stimulates human creativity. Um, you know, people who are geneticists have found themselves having new creative ideas about genetics following ayahuasca sessions. It just seems to open up areas that have previously been closed down. And in my case, I can't draw to save my life, but I write, and and ayahuasca has definitely pr profoundly affected my writing. So, so there's a the, the strong element of that story was was gifted to me in the visionary realm uh, by ayahuasca, and I was left to do the legwork in you know putting it down in in words. Any reader of of your books from Sun and the Seal um, through to Supernatural will find all those themes and more in, in Entangled. Now, for okay. instance. Let me just touch on a couple of them. Do you believe time travel is possible? I really do, yeah. I believe, I believe time travel is possible and that time itself um, is much more complicated than we think. And, and this is a point I make strongly in Entangled, that, that we have this linear notion of time, time's arrow, that past, present and future all run in a straight line uh, and that therefore while the past may impact on the future, it's impossible for the future to impact on the past. Um, I take a totally opposite view in, in Entangled, that, that time is a spirals and, and a sort of cat's cradle of lines that interwrap and interweave and that different epochs can be closely connected to one another and that actually the future can have an effect on the past, that the past can be changed, that any unobserved element of the past can be changed by things that happen in the, in the future. That's a, that's a key element of the story in Entangled, the, the, and time travel is central to that story because the two protagonists, Rhea 24,000 years ago and Leone today, uh, make direct contact with one another, and they do so in altered states of consciousness, and both DMT and ayahuasca uh, feature very strongly in the story of Entangled as the, and psilocybin, in the case of Rhea, as the agents that allow... Uh, these young women to leave the confines of the body and of the material realm and to travel freely through time and through space. You also draw attention to the, the, the epoch of 22,000 BCE. Yeah. Can you elaborate on why? Well, um, I, I just felt very strongly that that was the time um, that, that I needed to draw attention to. Um, I felt I felt this from the from the from the visionary experience that I was to, that, that I was very much set in the Stone Age in twenty four thousand years ago, um, but but there are research elements that are relevant to this. Uh, it was a period when there was a huge explosion in cave art, cave art thirty five thousand years ago, down to about twenty eight thousand years ago, and then it went into abeyance and it stopped happening, uh, and then it reemerged again a bit later in the time of Lascaux. Uh, you know, 17, 18,000 years ago. So I thought it'd be very in interesting to set the, this epoch in this time when our ancestors had forgotten how to use cave art. Um, when they, and, and indeed, in Entangled, cave art is something that they speak of as happening in the long ago. That's something that the people in the past did, but that they're not doing uh, anymore. Um, because they've become very materialistic, they've become very closed down. And that's partly why the encounter with the Neanderthals is so important in the story, because that's to help them to come out of that. And to, and to, when we do battle with evil, we are also doing battle with the evil within ourselves. It's not only an external thing, and that's that's a key part of the story uh, of Entangled. Well, it also happens that it looks like the last Neanderthals uh, lived in Spain at around 24,000 years ago. And uh, it's a key issue of Entangled uh, as to what was the fate of the Neanderthals. Was it, were they brought to extinction by the cruel and wicked behavior of us, of ourselves? Or did they die out some other way? And it turns out to be fundamental to the future of the human species as to how they died out. And that's what will ultimately be borne out in the in the story of Entangled. Um, 
that 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 the struggle of Rhea is fundamentally the struggle to prevent anatomically modern humans from destroying the Neanderthals. Because if we do that, then we invite evil into our lives and it manifests throughout history. And that's what has to be stopped. What do you think caused the extinction? Well, um, I'm, again, I'm, 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 I'm open on this, but um, I, I don't want to, in a way, I don't want to give away the, uh, the plot of the second part of Entangled and, and what, will, what will happen there. I do have a view on that, on that subject. Very good. So, so those who want the answer will have to read Entangled and get ready for part two. Yeah. That's Fantastic. Right. So, so 2012, notwithstanding, what does the future hold for Graham Hancock? Um, well, I'm, uh, I'm embracing uh, fiction uh, very strongly at the moment. I've, uh, I, I'm, I am going to go back and write the second volume of Entangled, uh, because what's out there at the moment is, is volume one. And I've actually written 100 pages of the second volume. But for certain complicated reasons to do with my publishers as much as anything else, uh, but also because I think there was stuff I needed to learn, um, I'm writing a, a whole series of other novels, first three novels, of which I've already written two. Uh, and this is um, a, a fantasy adventure series based very strongly historically on the events of the Spanish conquest of Mexico. Uh, and again, the themes of the battle against good, of, of good against evil, come very strongly uh, into this story, uh, because we then had the clash of two... Uh, remarkably cruel cultures, uh, one of which was the Mexica culture that people refer to as the Aztecs, and the other of which was the Spanish uh, un under Cortes. And, and actually, both of these cultures had, uh, had embraced evil in uh, re really astonishing and, and, and horrific ways. And in telling the story of the Spanish conquest, I'm also telling that story of that inner battle and that inner journey between darkness and, and, and light. And I've written two uh, out of the three volumes of that. I have the third volume, which I'm just starting to write uh, now. Uh, I believe it'll take me another six months or so to complete that, perhaps a little longer. Uh, and then I'll go back and write the finish, the second volume of uh, Entangled. And then I may, just possibly, uh, do um, a follow-up to Fingerprints of the Gods, go back to non-fiction, but to try to set aside all my over-concern on the critical apparatus and just concentrate on the adventure. Because of these new developments that we've discussed in this in this interview, uh, notably the implications of Gobekli Tepe and the implications of a gigantic cometary impact over North America 10,900 BC, uh, those two issues together, I think, single-handedly resurrect the entire lost civilization hypothesis. And I think that they justify um, the time and effort that would be required to add substantially to the dossier of evidence that I already provided in Fingerprints of the Gods. Um, I, if I take that on, it'll be a very major task. It'll be three years of my life. Uh, but I feel we've reached the point in the evidence where, where we're reaching a tipping point and there's enough there to make it sensible to do that and to, and to do it fairly soon. Fantastic. Thank you so much for all that you have done and uh, by the sounds of it are, are about to do and continue to do. So thank you ever so much. Thank you. My thank pleasure. You. It's all been right. fun. Thank you. Thanks so much.